Uh, thank you for a very kind introduction, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to start off trying to be fairly broad and introduce molecular dynamics. Most of you may be familiar with that, some of you may not. Uh, so hopefully we'll start fairly easily and then we'll get a little bit more complex as we go through. Um, so first, University of Florida, well, everybody has an image of Florida, it usually involves two big black ears. But it's actually a real place, you know, it's not just a... Um, there's the United States up on the top left, and as you probably, probably already know, here's Florida. Um, it's quite big, it's about half the size of Germany, physically. So it's not a sm particularly small place. Uh, Miami is down here. Uh, Orlando, where Mickey lives, is right here. Uh, we're here, about 100 miles north uh, of Orlando in a town of a... It's probably... A, it's two-thirds the size of Aachen, but not nearly as interesting. Um, so the university... Here's some pictures of the university. This is kind of what the town looks like. Lots and lots of trees. We're very tropical. The temperature today is probably about 32 to 35, something like that. Uh, you're from India, it's probably something you're used to. <laughs> um, uh, very warm. This is the football stadium. So this is uh, where they play uh, the, fo the football games. And my office is just, just off the picture here. They, play, they, they, put, they use this stadium eight times a year and they put 90,000 people in it to watch football games. So that is not the main purpose of the university. With the Gators, that's the, that's the sports, sports logo, alligators. Alligators are everywhere in Florida. Uh, they're on campus, in some of the lakes on campus. Um, my wife is a keen kayaker. I go, sometimes go with her you know, in, the, in the boats, on the rivers, and there's always alligators there as well. They don't really bother you. Um, if you don't bother them, they'll leave you alone. Um, so Florida, as I say, is a real place. There's real people there. There's 20 million people and the GDP. So it's, it's roughly the same size and pop, the same population, the same uh, GDP as Holland, as the Netherlands. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real place. It's the third, it's the third um, largest by population and the third largest economically state in America now. After California is number one, which is huge. Now California has the economy of France and then Texas and then Florida. Uh, the University of Florida is where I teach is 50,000 students, about 5,000 faculty. The budget is about 2.5 billion euros. That's a, a, uh, a dollars and a euro and a dollar are about the same. So it's about 2.5 billion euros. And the research budget is about 700 million a year. I'm in the College of Engineering, um, which is large by American standards, but not large compared with with here, where there's most, of, I mean, most of the students here are engineers. We have about 10,000 engineers, 7,500 undergraduates, 2,500 graduates. Our research budget is about 70 million a year. Uh, the rest of this, about half of this is at the medical school, in medical science. And then we just recently had a $50 million gift, which we're leveraging to $300 million. Fundraising is a big thing at American universities. So that's where I am. It's a real place. It's not just Mickey Mouse and old people. Okay. So questions. I'm very happy to take short, clarifying questions at any point. If you have just something you just, just want a, a quick question with a quick answer, great, any time. And I'll stop after each section for a Q&A period. So it'll be about six, something like six opportunities for, for more extensive Q&A. I don't want you to save things to the end, but you'll have lost interest and you'll have forgotten them. To keep, to keep you engaged with me. And and I welcome follow-up questions and discussion by email. I understand this is going to be, um, well, this is being recorded. I'm happy to make the slides available to you as well. Um, and so if you follow, want to follow up on this, something arises in your own work, I'm happy to discuss that with you. Okay. So a little bit of history. Um, so this was from a talk I actually gave to a much older group. You're more aware of this, but still I think there's some things you're not, maybe not fully aware of. You may be aware of, you know, you're aware of Moore's Law, doubling every, every two years, things like that. But actually how that plays out over an extended period of time is, is uh, quite remarkable. So this shows, goes back to only about 1992, 93. So it's probably 
about the time when many of you were born, right? Roughly then. And what we're seeing here, so the red one, for example, is the fastest computer in the world. And so it went from a score of 100 to a score of over 10 million in your lifetime. That's what's happened with that doubling every 18 months. That we've gone from basically uh, you know, 100,000 times more powerful computers in that 20 years. Now I go back even further in time. I go back another decade from this. And so there's another, so that's way down, way down there somewhere. But this is, then this is, the, this is the most powerful computer. This was like the 500th computer. And this is the sum of the, comp the top uh, computers. And you can see there's a pretty linear uh, process here. What's happening here is new generations of, you know, uh, of, of large cluster computers came online. New IBM SPs or whatever it was, the latest thing, will come online. And they would run for two or three years. And then there'll be a next generation. But the total of these top 500 is increasing pretty linearly from they are from 1,000 now to 100 million. Again, a factor of about 100,000. That's, that's, that's not just an evolutionary change, that's a revolutionary change. It means that we can do things now that we couldn't possibly have imagined doing back then. How does that play out? This, now, this goes back to my generation more. So this is something you, you, you may have heard of as, as an antique. It's like an old car, like a, like a first generation uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Um, now your grandpa drove it. Um, 1985, Cray 2, which was the computer everybody wanted to work on back then. It got one gigaflop per second, and it cost in 2010 dollars 32 million dollars. That means it was 32 thousand dollars per megaflop per second. Okay, that's how much it, it it cost. Now if we fast forward, here's a 2010 iPad. This is the iPad that you may have in the bottom dr in your drawer somewhere because it's too old and clunky and too slow to use now because it's seven years out of date. That was 699. That was 40 cents as opposed to $32,000 per megaflop per second. And if we go to a Intel i7 processor, uh, 40, uh, 40 gigaflops per second, the cost is about um, 4 cents. So we've gone from $32,000 to four cents as the cost of production. <laughs> I mean, think of that. Gasoline had done that. You know, petrol. Cars, it, would, be a, it wouldn't have any cost at all associated with, with gasoline. So this, again, has, has me meant that there's a complete revolution going on. And it's continuing to go on in computational science. So what that's that's done, and you've probably, many of you have probably seen a chart like this before, is it's allowing, allow, allowing, allow, now allowing us to look at a wide range of phenomena. So this is showing increasing time, this is showing increasing length. So short times, short lengths are out here, long times, long lengths are out here. So sort of back in the old days, then we had, we could do a little bit at the very short length scale, you know, a few atoms, um, this was sort of one, this was at physics and chemistry level. Really not materials science at all, but just basic physics and chemistry. And it wasn't necessarily very accurate, very precise. Uh, but we could do something there. And we could do something out here with finite element methods, which most of you mechanical engineers probably had more finite element methods than you want. But that was the sort of thing that we could do back then. What's happened now is we've start, really started to fill in fill in the gaps. Now we can do simulations here. These are things like molecular dynamics simulations on length scales in, in now in the orders of hundreds of nanometers or more, time scales of picoseconds to nanoseconds. These are kind of routine now. And if you have big machines and lots of money, you can go, you can go much further than this. And can na now we can <coughs> sort of look at nanoscale phenomena. And then we can also go up and we can look at microstructural phenomena with lots of microstructural uh, type methods. So what's na now happened is we've kind of gone, this, this, this whole thing is now linked up from, this is electronic structure methods, MD methods, things like phase field methods to find that element. And now kind of all linked and overlapping. What we're going to be talking about today is the molecular dynamics type, type thing, which is here. 
So one of the big challenges is, is um, for example, a project I'm working on is to do with uh, modeling of nuclear uh, reactors, maybe not very popular in this country, but it's an important issue in the US. We want to model it on this lens scale with information we gain from this lens scale. So one of the challenges is to pass materials <coughs> information, physics and chemistry materials and information, up the chain uh, from this lowest level of basic physics and chemistry and quantum mechanics all the way to the performance of a structure. And to get through, th get through that process, we need to understand, that we need to be a description of the interactions at the level of the atoms, as in a kind of molecular dynamics. And that's what we're going to be talking about mainly today. So one of the challenges for molecular dynamics, which we'll return to later on, I just want to give you an idea of, of part of where this is going, is the simulation of, of heterogeneous structures. So that's structures where you have different kinds of bonding all working together. So you, you have, now we're used to metallic bonding, covalent bonding and ionic. So a metal, no, aluminum or, what, or whatever. Covalent silicon or diamond, ionic, some kind of oxide. But device structures and material structures now are much, much more complicated. And they tend to have all of these interacting together. So what we need is methodologies which will allow us to say a metal and an ionic system, which might be an interconnect, or maybe looking at corrosion or thermal barrier coating, or you can see these other examples here, but allow uh, a system to describe all of these systems, all these kinds of bonding simultaneously <coughs> and without you interfering with it. So you don't prescribe it. You don't say, ah, this atom, this <coughs> silicon atom is covalent, but this silicon atom over here, because it's surrounded by oxygen, is ionic. We need the system to be able to do that autonomously and adjust to, to, to get the right kind of bonding. And we're going to talk about that in kind of the second half of the presentation. So outlined. We're going to have a rather general introduction to some molecular dynamics simulations and classical, classical energy models and force fields. So that's stuff that you might have seen if you've taken an MD class or a, a, a simulation class. That's the sort of stuff you may have seen already. Okay, but it, Hopefully, it will be a useful reminder and maybe a little something new there. Then I'm going to do a, a short case study. We're going to be looking at some older work of my own in ferroelectrics. And then we're going to be looking at some issues of complementarity. DFT, density functional theory, that's the electronic structure method. That's right down in the bottom corner of the chart of, of le length and time. That's more precise in general, more accurate than empirical methods like molecular dynamics, but way more expensive computationally. So this is an example of the way one can use these two together to get the best out of both. Then we're going to talk about charge optimized many into oh charge optimized it said into atomic should say many body charge optimized many body comb potentials and applications. That's something that goes back to this previous picture. That's the methodology that we've developed to attack this problem. You may have heard of this. You may have heard of REACTS FF as another, as another uh, uh, way of doing this. They're rather similar in many ways. So we'll be talking about that. Then if there's time, that's why this is grayed out, probably won't get to this uh, case study uh, of, uh, uh, to do with corrosion and mechanical behavior of zirconium clad, again, for nuclear reactors. Then finally, we're going to talk about rational design of interatomic potentials. It's a strange term, rational design, because that seems to say that what we've been doing before is irrational. Um, and what I will claim is well, it's not irrational, but it's not systematic. This is a way of designing potentials. This is work that we're, is very, very current, uh, but I think you'll uh, be able to appreciate it, I hope so, uh, of designing potentials, uh, essentially of engineering potentials in a systematic controlled, repeatable way. Uh, currently, that developing potentials is a, it's pretty much a black art. It takes a long time. It can take a student a year to develop a new potential for a system. And you're never really clear how good it is or how bad it is. You usually say, OK, it's good enough. And the criterion for it being good enough is the money's run out or the student needs to graduate. You know, it's not really a very strong scientific argument. 
And what I'm going to present is an approach and a very simple illustration of a way which is much more systematic and will tell you that, these, that there are actually a set of potentials you could choose, that these would make sense to choose, and then you can choose them for reasons which you can really describe very, very concisely in a way that somebody else can appreciate. So we'll get to that at the end. Okay. Any questions on kind of the program? So let's talk about this sort of introduction to molecular dynamics um, and classical force fields. So this is actually some slides I have from a colleague of mine, Professor Richard Hennig, um, which he used for a class. I've slightly modified them. So there's actually a lot of words in here. We're not going to discuss all of it. There's it's, it's too much, but it, it be, may be useful as part of the package that, that you, can, you can get a hold of later on uh, to provide some details. So first, I'm going to start with just a simple illustration of molecular dynamics. Uh, this is actually quite old work, uh, again from, from, from my group. Uh, this is uh, 15 years old uh, now. But still, it's quite, I think it's, qu it's quite interesting. And this is showing a tensile test on nanocrystalline aluminum. So this is aluminum metal, uh, grain size is about 45 nanometers. Don't worry about these sort of bits here, these gray bits. That's all to do with the primitive... Uh, visualization methods we had back, back in the old days um, in 2002. Uh, but what you're seeing here is the generation of dislocations, dislocations crossing stacking faults, uh, you're forming locks, um, and now we're, over this region we're forming um, uh, new grains. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing the mechanical evolution of a system at the atomic level. So this is a sort of question the molecular dynamics is very, very good at answering. Um, and as I say, this is quite an old simulation, so we can actually do, uh, do better now. But this does really sort of tell the story of what's going on. So what is, molec what are, is molecular dynamics simulation? So again, this is probably familiar to most of you, and that's okay. So all we're really doing in an MD simulation is solving Newton's equations of motion. So this is F equals MA. Force is mass times the second derivative of the position with respect to time. That's all we're doing. We solve that for every atom in the system and then repeat. Advance in time, repeat. Advance in time, repeat. Just do that many, many times. It's a very, very simple process. So we end up with N, uh, and, N coupled equations because the force on any given atom is uh, a function not only of where it sits, but its relative position, its position relative to its neighboring atoms. So obviously it interacts with them. So we have to know, every, every atom has to know where all the other atoms are to figure out what its force is, and then, uh, then we can go through this process. Now, there's two sort of parts to this. One is purely mathematical, which is just solving a simple differential equation, and we'll talk about that first, get that out of the way. All the physics is lying in what this force is. What is that force? That is a description of the interaction between the atoms in the system. That's the, the potential. That's where all the physics gets added, and that's where all of the hard work is, essentially. Once you have that written down, then everything else is essentially automatic. So, yes? It, it can be, let's get to that, because that's, we're going to be talking about potentials a lot in the future. Uh, hold that question. If you have it after we've discussed that, I'll be happy to, to look at it. Uh, but but it's, 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 a particular, it's, a, it's an energy function or functional, so it's, that's, it's a scalar quantity. But the forces are not. They're, they're vector quantities. So what are the goals of an MD type simulation? You can get ensemble averages. You can get an uh, average over a period of time, uh, which is uh, statistic from statistical mechanics is the same as the uh, average of ensemble. So you can get thermodynamic quantities. You can look at the real-time evolution, as I showed in that little, little video of the aluminum. So you, that gives you things like microstructural evolution or chemistry. And you can find the ground state of complex structures by doing optimization. What are the limitations? It has limitations in time scale and length scale. So, if you just think about the number of atoms involved, 
uh, then you know what we know what we know what the distance between atoms are is. It's a different separation of atoms is something like three angstroms. And so if you're going to have a cluster of atoms, uh, there's a certain number you can have. I should have worked out the numbers. I've forgotten them right now. But you know, you're, you're talking of a, a billion atoms being a fraction of a micron in size. So a billion atoms is still a lot, even now for simulations to do over an extended period of time. So that limits the size of the systems we can look at. The time scale is also limited. And the reason that's limited is we have to capture the vibrations of the atoms. We have, to we have to sample those vibrations as the atoms move against each other. And the period of that vibration is typically of about 250 femtoseconds. And to get a good statistics and get an accurate trajectory, that means you need to sample maybe once every femtosecond, once every two or three femtoseconds. So a time step is about a femtosecond. So a million time steps is a nanosecond. So that ha that's how we end up with length scales of tens to hundreds of nanometers and time scales of nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds. But microseconds is very rare and milliseconds are out of reach. So s short time scales. But these are the time scales which are appropriate for, physical and uh, for chemical and medical physical changes in the system. So there's a lot we can see. And it's a classical method. Um, we're, we're not taking into account, we're not describing all the electrons in the system. We're just describing atoms basically as little balls interacting with each other and trying to write down an equation, that's the, the forces and the energy, which describes the effects of the electrons without including the electrons themselves. That's what makes it cheaper than doing electronic structure methods. As you probably know, DFT methods are restricted to a few hundred atoms, maybe a thousand at most. Whereas here we're talking maybe a billion, a billion at most. But if you're going from a thousand to a billion, that's a factor of a million in size, you're going to have to pay for it somehow. And what you pay for is you pay with a less sophisticated description of how the atoms interact with each other. That's the cost. Okay. okay. So there's lots of things we can calculate, potential energy, kinetic energy, we can calculate temperature. There's the point, yeah. Pressure, uh, we can look at heating curves, we can look at radio distribution functions, we can look at diffusion, we can look at transport coefficients, we can look at dynamical evolution of structures. All sorts of things we can determine from a molecular dynamic simulation. Now you're not going to do that for every case because you're probably going to be looking at one of these things and this should be a dot, dot, dot here. There's many other things you can look at as well. But you'll be picking one of these things that you're particularly interested in for your particular, ap particular application. You know, maybe you're interested in diffusion, for example, diffusion of a, of, um, of a um, gas species through a, 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 a moth, an organic framework or something like that for, for, for separation science. Who knows what you're, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can, you can use this for. So, we have to integrate Newton's equations in motion, and there are various ways to do that. Do, to do that. And I'm going to illustrate one method, which is simple and robust. Um, so, you have to s select an integrator, and here's a number of ones which you would run across in, in your, uh, your studies. The Verley method, which is the one we're going to talk about, this is very easy to illustrate. Uh, and then leapfrog, different vari variations of Verley. And there's something called a predictor corrector method, of which the gear method is, is quite a common one. So these are ways of going from advancing the equations. So you can calculate from the positions at one time in the forces, you can calculate the position at the next time. And you're going to do that as, as a function of time. And so what, what's, what you want from these methods, you want them to be robust. That means you don't want it to break. You don't want, the, you, you don't want to put a simulation on and then it fails for some reason. The math, the math goes crazy and you get infinities. That's not good. You want long-term conservation of the constants of motion. So that says you want to conserve energy and momentum, for example. And uh, there's other more, you want time reversible, you want to f preserve phase-space volume. These are another, other requirements 
from a mathematical point of view. And then there's all sorts of add-ons uh, you can talk about. You can apply thermostats, for example, to fix the temperature. You can apply what's called a barostat to fix the pressure. There's all sorts of additional things that you can add to, your, to the MD code, uh, which may be useful for particular applications. We're going to talk less about those um, in, this, in this discussion. So let's talk about this, this, this simple integration method to illustrate how uh, we can actually um, advance this MD simulation. So let's just write down the position of uh, an atom at time t plus delta t is a Taylor series. It's the position at time t plus the derivative of the position, which is the velocity times delta t, plus a half, the acceleration times delta t squared, uh, plus the third order term, and then the, air, the part we dropped is the fourth order term. Okay, so if we write that out for t plus delta t, and then we write it out for t <coughs> minus delta t, say, if we know the position now, what was the previous position? Then we get an equation that looks very similar. There's a, the position, there's a velocity term, there's an acceleration term, and there's, a, there's, there's this third order term, and then there's an error. Okay, so that's just Taylor series. That's, ma that's just basic, basic math. Now, the, the magic comes when we add those two equations together. So we're going to add these two equations together and rearrange it a little bit. Notice if we add this side and this side, then we add this side, where we get the 2RT here, the, vol the, the velocity terms cancel out. They disappear entirely. The acceleration terms, we lose the half and get a 1. The third order term disappears. That cancels out. And then the error is of order to the fourth. So if we just rearrange that a little bit, we can now say the, time, the position at time t plus delta t is just twice the position of uh, the previous time minus the time minus 1 plus the term, which is acceleration. And then the error is in delta t to the fourth. So which is good. So the error is one high, more order of magnitude lower than we might expect. One power lower. And you can see this is pretty easy to, that means we all have to do is track the position of the, uh, an atom at three time steps. Time zero, say time one, time two, time three. And then we can then two, three, four. So you don't have to actually accumulate that much information. You don't have to get, you don't have to keep track of the position for a very long time. And all you have to calculate is the acceleration. So this is a pretty simple method. And um, again, this is very robust. It, it, it's not maybe not the, the best method to use for a research level, but it's a great starter method. Um, and where does the physics lie? The physics lies in this acceleration. The acceleration is the force divided by the mass. And the force comes from the description of the interatomic interactions. So that's where, all, that's where the rubber hits the road, as they say in the States. That's what we need to be concentrated on. So I'm going to skip through some of these, I think, because I don't want to get bogged down in these kind of equations. So that's the, that's the methodology. That's how you actually do it. That's what the guts of a, a MD code is. It's like the engine in a car, uh, but you know, there's a difference between my car and a Formula One car. Uh, they both have engines, but the engines are very different. So in these uh, MD codes that you can, uh, which are widely used, the engines are much more sophisticated and all the bells and whistles uh, are, are added in, all these capabilities are added in for you. So one that's, that's, very, well, well, that's very popular in the States and I think elsewhere is called LAMPS. Um, and I've forgotten multi-particle simulator. Uh, I've forgotten what all the acronym is. It's from San Diego National Laboratories in the US. There's a large user base. There's user group discussions and stuff like that. So if you're getting into MD for the first time, uh, this is actually a good place to start. Uh, DL Poly has is, is is been around for a very long time uh, from the UK. That's still widely used. And a newer one uh, is called who MD Blue? Uh, that comes out of um, Sharon Glotz's lab at uh, University of Michigan, and she's more of a soft matter simulator than a hard matter simulator. So 
So for soft matter people, that might be something to look into. There's dozens of others, I'm sure. And I haven't attempted to be, to be uh, complete. Lattice statics, that means if you're just trying to find the, like, like, like some, the basic structure and some defect energies and things like that. Then GULP, uh, general utility lattice program, developed uh, by an individual, uh, Julian Gale, used to be in Imperial College London, has been now at Curtin University in Australia for many, many years. Um, this is like half a million lines of code, and he wrote every single one. Um, and it's very, very powerful for doing uh, basic structural optimization, things like that. And very, very fast, fractions of a second. So that's very useful code. And if you're looking at things like phonons, there's this phonopy, uh, and uh, one that uh, from my group called FONTS, Phonon Transport Simulator, and they, they look at uh, things that relate to phonons um, beyond um, the phonon density of states, things like phonon transport. Again, there's going to be more, there's, there's many more of these. But the point is that for almost any application uh, that you're interested in, if you have a science problem you're trying to tackle, there is a tool out there. It's just a question of finding that right tool. There's a tool which has been well developed and well tested, and that's, that's the way to go, usually. Um, experimentalists, some experimentalists, when they have very high-end experiments, they'll build their own experimental tools, but often they'll purchase them from Philips or, or somewhere. This is like buying your tool. It's getting the tool off the shelf. It's what you do with it. That's, wh that's, where, that's where the intellectual value comes from. So don't be so enthusiastically embrace these, these existing tools. Don't try and write your own, unless you have to. And that, that's an assessment to make early on in the process. OK. Time for some questions. I can see at least eyes are open. That's good, I guess. OK. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just started with these AMI simulations, like yeah. twice. <laughs> Negative pressure. Yeah, that, I mean, it, that, think about this as, a, as, as something which is, uh, think of a, a pulsation in a balloon or something like that. It will expand too much. That's negative pressure, and then it will contract again. So you'll get these fluctuations in equilibrium around, say, if it's a zero pressure, you'll get, you'll get fluctuations around the zero pressure value. It's always trying to adjust, trying to get the volume just right. But as it as it tries to get the volume just right here, there's something else going on which makes it either want to go out or go back in. So that is perfectly normal. It's part of the statistics of this. It just doesn't, yeah, as you say, it doesn't make sense physically. But from a, a statistical mechanical point of view and an MD point of view, it's fine. Okay. Any more? Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the interatomic interactions. So this is where we put in the physics and the chemistry. This is where we add value. Up to now, it's just been really been an exercise in, in solving an ordinary differential equation. That's not, not, very, not very complicated. So, so we have some atomic structure. What is, I don't know what this is. Uh, some kind of atomic structure. And we, what we want is an energy model. We want a model which, which describes the interaction of, of these silver atoms with these gold atoms. And usually we know something in advance. We know, for example, we know what, we know what material we're looking at, so we usually know, for example, what kind of bonding it's going to be. So if it's silicon, we know it's, it's covalent. If it's, say, strontium titanate, we know it's largely ionic. If it's um, you know, an alloy, metal alloy, uh, copper nickel, we know it's going to be metallic. So we have some idea about the type of bonding that's going on, the type, the underlying physics. And we're going to use that and exploit that in developing our energy models. So, so to describe those interactions is sort of hierarchy of methods. The, top, the, the most accurate, so this is most accurate, and his accuracy increasing here, speed here, right? Where would we like to be? We'd love to be out here, right? Highly accurate. 
and very high speed. But you know, you can't. That's just not. That's just not going to happen. So, and it, you sort of march down here. Here is highly accurate methods. So this is when you really do using quantum mechanical methods, um, either using uh, quantum chemical methods based on Hartree-Fock theory, or <coughs> electronic structure methods based on density functional theory. That's where kind of where you are. You're getting high accuracy uh, to get things like e energy, energies and structures, but it's very slow. In the middle, it's sort of semi-empirical methods. Those are methods which are, have a certain amount of quantum <coughs> mechanics in them, but not a huge amount. And so those are uh, less accurate, uh, but a little bit faster. Finally, you have empirical methods, which is sort of which are the, what usually used in, in molecular dynamics, where you really just write down a functional form for the interactions based on your understanding of the basic physics. We're going to be focused mainly here. You're very familiar with this from things like uh, DFT codes like VAS and Gaussian quantum chemical codes, things like that. You're probably less familiar with this region, um, and I think there's a good reason here. The idea of developing these semi empirical methods was to capture all that was best of, of quantum mechanics in terms of accuracy uh, with the speed of, of uh, as much speed as possible of as, uh, empirical methods. In most cases, it captures the worst of both. You have a large degradation, often you get a large degradation in accuracy for relatively little speed input, speed, speed up. I'm sure there are exceptions and somebody may take exception to that comment, but but it, historically, that's been the case. That um, these are not necessarily been very successful methods. So it tends to be either this or this. So we've kind of gone through that. I think quantum mechanical methods. You know, you're basically starting from Schrodinger equation. You go either through Hartree-Fock theory and and beyond that, and add add embellishments to that, or you go through density functional theory and add embellishments to that. That's what those methods are. And, the, and then we're talking about, we're talking about uh, in DFT, we're talking about 100 to three, 500 atoms, maybe 1,000. And in some of these quantum chemical methods, if you're trying to get very high accuracy, which some of them can do, then they scale as like order of uh, the number of electrons to the seventh power or ninth power. I mean, they're very good. They get very, very, very expensive. So people can still look at uh, usefully look at nitrogen molecule. Right. That's very interesting from a chemical point of view, but I'm a material scientist and I just don't care. Don't record that. <laughs> okay, semi-empirical methods, we kind of talked about that. Those are tight binding is one of those methods, Huckel theory. And as, as, I, as I've indicated, I'm not a fan of those. Empirical methods, then we have a functional form, and we'll see some functional forms. That's just an equation. We write down some equation. And it has some parameters. Um, and those are just things that we don't know. And what we'll do is we'll, fiddle, we'll, we'll determine what we will determine values for those parameters that reproduce as much of the physics and chemistry as we can of the material we're interested in. So there are various examples. So we'll start off with pair potentials, which they're easy to understand. and they they capture the concept and they were very important in the early stages of this. Then we'll move on to many body and effective medium potentials and then we'll eventually we'll talk about charge equilibration methods. Okay. So pair potentials. So the idea of a pair potential is that the energy of an atom, my energy, just depends on the position, the on my interaction with my neighbors. So how close you are to me, you are to me, you are to me, you are to me, you are to me. And I probably don't care about you in the back corner. You're far enough away I can probably ignore your interaction with me. So what we do is we just calculate these individual interactions, essentially add up those, uh, what those forces are. Right? And that's the force on me. Likewise, force on Doctor Who includes the contribution from me equal and opposite contribution from me. But now he may care about the people in the back row because he's a little bit closer to them. They may interact with him as well. So that's very simple. So it's just saying that this energy is a function just not even of the, of the vector of the position. It's just the distance, how far away they are. 
That's what a pair potential says. And you can just add all those up and you get some function. It's very easy. It's very simple. Um, it captures a lot of basic physics, uh, but it has some drawbacks. I'm going to look at, look at those. So the classic example here is the so-called Leonard Jones potential. And Leonard Jones is one person, not two. That's him, Sir John Leonard Jones. And he, was this, he did this, you see, back in 1931. He was trying to work out some things to do with the properties of noble gases. And so what he wrote down was an equation uh, that tried to capture the interactions of one noble gas atom with another. Okay, so let's kind of walk through it. We'll walk through the picture first, and then we'll work, work, work on the equation. Okay? So the idea here, here's the energy versus separation. Here's zero. So far, far away, the energy between two noble gas atoms is zero. But it is attractive. It's the van der Waals interaction. We know it's always going to be slightly attractive. So this is zero and infinitely far away, but any finite distance is a little less than zero, and it's getting stronger as you get closer. Okay? So that's what, that explains sort of that downward part. Now you start to get real close, that binding gets really strong. But physically, so this is like me interacting with you, I can get, I get now we're talking for example, we tend, to talk, we tend to get closer and closer to each other so we can talk reasonably. But if I start talking like this, <laughs> what's he going to do? He backs off, right? He doesn't like it. That's what this is. This is that repulsive part when two atoms get too close to each other. And what's interesting, going back to the analogy here, as you may have experienced, different countries, different cultures have different comfort zones of distance. Some people like to be really on top of each other, and some people like to be further away. And you, you may have experienced it, I've certainly experienced it, where I've been interacting with somebody from a culture who likes to be close, and I end up walking backwards, <laughs> kind of around the room, because every time I take a step back to get to my comfort distance, they take a step forward to get back to their comfort distance. And we just kind of dance around the room. That's what this is, that's the same interaction. So it's attractive, this is the ideal point, and then, then at some point is a hard repulsion. In this case, that's just the overlap of the electrons, right? And the electrons that's been to overlap is a hard repulsion. So how do you capture that in an equation? That's what Leonard Jones said. How do we capture that in an equation? Well, it turns out we know what van der Waals is. We know that van der Waals interactions go with one upon r to the sixth. You can actually work, you can work that out. It's, not, it's, it's fairly simple physics. And so we put that in. And he said, well, we need a repulsive term here. And so, just for simplicity, we'll make it of the same form. It's 1 over r to the something. He could have chosen a different form, and we'll see different forms later. He said, well, we'll use the fact of power of 12, because 12 is twice times 6, and it makes the arithmetic easier. That was the logic, essentially, of the, of the 12 in Leonard Jones. And occasionally, you see like 614 or 610 Leonard Jones potentials. Particularly in the in the in the chemical physics literature, but the logic was just simply that this was double that, and it just made the ma the math easier. So you write down this equation, and you'll see in here, buried in here, this is some kind of energy, and this is some sort of kind of distance to make the units all work out. So this is what it looks like, and you can put that into an MD code. It's very easy to do, and you can actually simulate an ideal gas. And this was actually used for many many years to simulate metals as well because we didn't have anything better until the mid-80s. Well, it turns out in Leonard Jones there's some, some, there's some simplifying things. If you scale things appropriately, if you tell the, scale the temperature by, uh, to, in these units, epsilon, uh, the pressure in these units and the density in these units, then there's only one Leonard Jones potential. They're all the same. Well, they're all the same. Everything just scales out. Um, but still, you, so... You can still use it in reduced units, which physicists like to do, or you can use it in, you know, put in angstroms and, and joules, uh, which, or electron volts, which is what material scientists tend to like, that have real units. So this is ideal for noble, noble gases, and uh, works very well, uh, and as I say, it's been used extensively for metals as well in the literature. 
in the older literature. So here's another one that you'll come across, the Bourne Mayor uh, Buckingham potential. Here's our one upon R to the sixth term. This is the Van der Waals term again. You saw, but in this case now the repulsion, instead of being the power law, is now just an exponential repulsion. This is a common form that's used in, uh, in simulation of ionic materials. Uh, then there's something called the Morse potential uh, that looks like this. Um, and that's often used for diatomic materials. This was uh, even older than uh, Leonard Jones, 1929. Um, he was looking at vibrational structures back then. And of course, all this was you know, hand calculation. Then you can look at things like uh, here's his application that's a bond stretching of, of um, methane. And what you can see here is uh, supposedly exact potential, which is something which has come from a uh, high level quantum mechanics. And you can see the Morse potential, which is reproducing it pretty well. Here's some other approximations which aren't doing so well. So this is something which describes methane, for example, uh, quite nicely. There's other pair potentials out there. Uh, there's many forms. Um, we're not going to go through them. But then, then we've kind of swept under the rug. What is the epsilon and what is the sigma? If I'm saying, say I'm using, uh, using a Leonard Jones potential for copper, which, which I have done in, my old, in, in the old days when I was your age. Believe it or not, I was your age once. Then uh, what are the epsilon sigma values we should use? How do you determine those? And that gets into this, this question, which we, we're going to return to a number of times, on how do we fit potentials. Uh, so what you have to do is you say, well, I'm fitting copper. Okay, well, so what's important about copper? Well, I know the lattice parameter. The lattice parameter is 3.616 angstroms. Actually, uh, not the lattice parameter. That's the nearest neighbor distance, I think. Anyway, that's a length scale. I have a length scale there. And I have to have some kind of energy scale. I can put, the, or I can put the energy scale in in various ways. I can put it. Uh, the best way to put it in, the most useful way, usually, is through the elastic constants. Because we're interested in a metal, we want to see how how soft or hard it is. So by putting in the elastic constants in, that gives us an energy energy and length scale. We can go through that. Or we could choose different kinds of properties too: phonon frequencies, defect energies, surface energies. We may be interested in all of these things. If you want to describe. Uh, a wide, wide range of properties of a material, even a simple material like an FCC metal such as copper, then you've got a lot of things here. But in Leonard Jones, we have epsilon and sigma. We have two numbers to play with. And we've already said really that it's, it's really only one number anyway because it all scales out. But we're trying to describe a whole bunch of things. It's hard to describe 10 properties with two numbers. So we have to make some compromises. So, what are the limitations of pair potentials? We've seen it works very well for noble metals, uh, for noble gases. So, what are the limitations? So, the limitations uh, count the bonds. Is what, now, I was standing here, I was counting the distance to the, my various neighbors. But now, when I'm standing here, I've got these three neighbors, but I don't have any neighbors behind me. So, I'm not really taking that effect. Now, if I stand here, I have th three neighbors. But they're different. The direction is different. I haven't taken into account really the, 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 the different directions. I haven't taken into account the organization, how people are arranged around me, just how far away they are. This always leads to close pack structures. You always end up getting like an FCC metal out of this. That's why it kind of works for FCC. It always ends up with a dense structure. Um, and the pair potential then determines a lot of, of properties in a very simple way. Uh, so we'll see that in this next slide. So here's some noble gases here. And don't worry about what these numbers particularly are. So this is some, okay, this is some cohesive energy. Uh, argon and krypton in these units, the value is 12, 11 by 12. FCC metal is the value is about 30. And lo and behold, Leonard Jones is about 13. So you can see. It's doing a reasonably good job here. It's doing a lousy job there. What's the, formation, what's the vacancy formation energy? This is vacancy formation energy in, in, 
in solid, no, these are actually noble solids in this case. You can see here, uh, one is about 0.95, uh, which is close to the, the one from the Len Jones, one's lower, but all these are a third to a quarter of that value. They're nowhere close. What's the ratio of C11, C12 to C44? This is called the Cauchy inequality. Leonard Jones says it's one. Noble gases are pretty much close to one. And these values can be very, very far from one. So you can see that just in, in the major properties of these simple metals, and these are all FCC metals, that this potential really doesn't do a very good job. And that's what these things say. So how do we, how do we resolve that? If we don't have the pair potential, it's not good enough, then what do we need? We need something which has some environmental awareness. So for example, let's go back to the analogy of a conversation or an interaction we had. If I'm standing right here, I can give you all of my attention. But if I'm standing right here, my attention is divided amongst the three of you. If I'm standing here, now there's four people who have got part of my attention. So that's saying my interaction is depending the amount, I can, the amount of energy or time I can put into a specific interaction depends on how many interactions I have. The more interactions I have, the less time, less energy I can spend on each one. Okay. Now put that back into the physics language. It's that, that number, which is the number of interactions, is the coordination number. How many neighbors do I have? That means I can only interact a certain amount with each neighbor. And the more neighbors there are, the, the, le the less strongly I can interact with each one. So we have to have some awareness of that built in to this function. So the squares are some kind of data from some kind of calculation. This is for aluminum. And then this line is a functional fit. And it's saying that the energy Goes as, it's, got, it's got a z to the half term and a z term where z is the coordination. And presumably these, these coefficients are, are negative. Or at least the alpha is negative as this goes down. So this again is saying if the more neighbors you have, the less energy you have to expend on each neighbor. Or if you think of it in terms, another way of thinking about this is if your interaction, uh, if you're an atom that's going to be charged, if you've got if you've got uh, a larger number of, of atoms around you to share electrons with or donate electrons to, the more there are around you, the less you can give to each one. So there's always going to be a, an environmental dependence. And that was missing in the Leonard Jones. So we want to add that in. And this gives us a clue that says something is to do with the number, some form which, re which decreases with the coordination number, the number of bonds that I have. And so for pair potentials, this is just a linear function. And for metals, we get this quadratic term. So this just says the more interactions I have, each one is equally strong. This is the more interactions I have, the, the, the stronger the energy. This one says no, because you have to reduce the amount of energy you can invest in each interaction as the number goes up. And that's what metals do. Yes? One question. So this is constrained to a fixed geometry or because you are showing that this one, one value of one. So this was looking at the, the, the reason here there was different points at the same number is that those corresponded to different, jo different arrangements of atoms around, around. So this one had eight neighbors, but these were, uh, where the eight were arranged in a different ways. That's why you've got this slight, slight differences here. So it, um, it's not for a fixed geometry. You can use it for any geometry. You just count, the, basically you count the neighbors. Um, and it gets a little bit more subtle than that. But it's, it's a neighbor counting method of saying that depending on my environment, how many people are around me, it has an effect on, on how much energy I can invest in interacting with each one. So, for example, 
if we go from this z to this z to the one half uh, uh, relationship, it turns out the cohesive energy for a pair potential is just six times uh, the bonding energy. For an FCC, you've got 12 bonds, and uh, half of the energy is mine, half of the energy belongs to the other atom, so I end up with six. So you get the same, basically the same value regardless of the structure. And for metals, then you can get uh, vacancy, run. and then the vacancy formation energy you can get um, is um, basically the cohesive energy. And here we can get values which are about half the cohesive energy, just by doing some simple, um, simple math here. So what this is saying is, because I'm sharing less and less energy with all these many neighbors, if I get pulled out of the system, it's easier than if I'm sharing the full amount of energy with each of them. And we're going to see that now in a minute. We're going to see that become a sort of mathematical form. And this is the foundation of the embedded atom method, uh, which many of you may be familiar with for metals, which was developed in the early 80s, 1983. It was the first paper on this. We have different situation uh, with silicon. And then uh, here's the energy. Energy per bond as a function of coordination is going in the opposite direction. And so we have a different set of physics, and we'll get to the physics of silicon in a minute. So how do we go overcome this deficiency of pair potentials? So we're going to move, pair potential is a function. We're going to move to something which is now a functional. So if you remember, a functional is a function of a function. Okay. So, so we've got an inner function and an outer function. An inner function is basically going to be a measure of the local environment. And what I'm going to use essentially is the density of my neighbors. And from that, then when I know that density, then I'm going to work out what the energy is. That's the function of the function. The inner, the inner function is the density, which is from the local environment. Then I use a, a look that up, and it gives me the outer function, which is an energy. That's the embedded atom method. So I'm going from pair potentials to pair functionals. Okay. And then we'll also be looking at cluster potentials. This is basically what we're doing for solving the silicon problem. And then we end up, of course, increasing the horror by going to cluster functionals. So cluster potentials really are just saying you expand the energy into larger and larger. Instead of looking at just pairs of energies, we now look at triplets of energies. And that makes sense for something like silicon, because you know, silicon is strongly covalent. You know, with a, these 109 degree bond angles, it really likes that 109 degree bond angle. And it doesn't like being at this, it doesn't like being at that. So there's an energy cost associated with, with that deviation of that bond angle. And that can be captured essentially in something which says that my interaction with this, this guy over here is going to depend on the position of this guy over here. Because I want them to be 109 degrees apart. And so that, that means I have to look at larger units than two atoms. I have to look at the three atoms. And, you can, and, and four atoms, you look at things like torsions and stuff in, in molecular chains, things like that. So let's go to the embedded atom method. And we're looking at the pair functionals. So we got a pair. So first of all, we'll start off with a pair potential. So we, because we saw that the Leonard Jones did some things right. So let's not throw out all that stuff. We may replace the precise form, but we'll keep that pair potential part. So we'll keep that. And now we have this embedding function. So that's the, the function I just talked about. And if you think, if you go back to your, to your basic solid state physics, then what you think of as, as the bonding in a metal, you have this sea of electrons, right? what the, the, the term that they, they use, at least in English, is it's like a, or jellium. Remember jellium jelly, model? They use that term. So it says the structure of the electrons is just like jello. It's, it's just, it's continuous and smooth. And so that all we want to understand, all we're really sampling in this embedding function is saying we're trying to sample the density of electrons, if you like, from the other atoms, which are determined my energy. That's the embedding. 
And that's all to do again with how many neighbors I have. So this is the embedded atom form. This was developed, as I said, in the early 80s. Um, and then this density, so this is, the de this is an embedding density which is pretending to be the electron density. That's the connection with density functional theory which is all about electron densities. But we're not using the electrons to calculate the, that density. We're just looking at the positions of the other atoms. And using those positions then to get some equation for the, what the density would be. So it turns out that you can go through this and it works pretty well. Um, and you can write this, you can write uh, this function here. You have to figure out what this function is. And it can be either an analytic function, like this z to the one half type thing, or it could be a tabulated, uh, uh, sorry, f of rho would be a, a portion of the square root of rho. Uh, but all these functions have to be worked out. You have to write down specific forms for them. But there are sort of techniques for doing that. And this has been now developed over the last 35 years, and there's some very um, successful methods, very successful uh, potential forms, which do a very good job in describing many, many properties of metals. Okay, those are the embedded atom methods, potentials. <coughs> Let's not. There's other terms, <coughs> other terms as well. These things called glue models. Uh, there's Finnis Sinclair models, equivalent crystal models. They, these all sort of were developed roughly the same time. They are similar in spirit, but slightly different in, in, in particulars, in format. But the basic idea is, is capturing something to do with electron density in some very empirical, empirical way. Okay, so then how, how does it do? Remember we saw the pair, we saw the pair potentials didn't do very well in some properties. Now let's look at some. These again are, are FCC metals, and many of them are the same ones were in the previous um, uh, figure. We're looking at some different quantities here. This is the thermal expansion coefficient, and you can see it does a pretty good job. These are within, uh, typically within 10%. Uh, and now here's the diffusion, activation energy for diffusion, and you can see we're getting some very good, uh, good, value, good agreement here. And the disagreement here, you know, is that these things are difficult to measure. It's just as likely that the experiments are wrong as the simulations are wrong, in fact. How about surface energies? Well, we can calculate surface energies with, uh, with uh, EAM. And um, the agreement's not so good uh, by any means. Uh, but these experiments are very, very difficult to do, and they're averaged over a whole bunch of surfaces. So these experimental numbers are pretty uh, poorly understood, even for something like the surface energy of copper, which you would think would be done, you know, 100 years ago. It's still not really well understood. So they, they actually may be doing a good, quite a good job here. These are the phonons. And so what are we seeing here? We're seeing the, the dots of the data points. And... The uh, blue line is DFT, so that's electronic structure methods, which should be good, expensive, but good. And you can see they match the blue lines pretty well. And then this uh, red and the green are two different empirical potentials, EAM potentials. And you can see in most places they do reasonably well. You can see some places where they, they don't do so well. The green one seems particularly poor up here, uh, but the red one does seem to do better. Uh, they're both a bit off here. But overall, the red one is actually doing fairly well, and the green one is not doing quite so well. They're not quite as good as DFT, but they are 1,000, 10,000 times cheaper. So you can do a lot more with them. Um, we can look at structures of grain boundaries, for example. And so... Um, what you're actually seeing here is these crosses are actually simulated positions and the dots are from the experiment. So you can see these actually match up very well for quite a complex grain boundary structure. So this is a defect property. So that's how we traditionally uh, describe metals. 
Now we want to go the other way. We're going to look at these cluster potentials, which it says we're looking at th three body terms, things like that. It's two, three, four body, higher order terms. Uh, typically, uh, third order is the one that we most often look at, and that's the case that in silicon I mentioned, where my interaction with this guy depends on this guy's uh, position because I want the angle between them to be 109 degrees. So, types of interactions are considered are bond stretching, bond bending, bond rotation, and electrostatic type terms, non bonding terms. So, let's look at uh, some examples here. So, here we have something where there's an underlying assumption here. The underlying assumption here is that, with the, that the, the bonding arrangement, the uh, geometry of the interactions doesn't change. And that if I'm a neighbor of you, I'm always going to be a neighbor of you. I'm never going to move far enough away that you're no longer my neighbor and you're my nearest neighbor. So this is for like chain-like molecules, things like that. And then you can have stretching terms, which just says the energy. Uh, this is a Hooke's, Hooke's law stretching term. This is a bending term to do with uh, bond angles. Here's bond rotations and here's the electrostatics. So this will be for something like a polymer type, type structure where you don't necessarily expect any uh, rebonding. You're not looking about breaking, but you're looking at the configuration of this, maybe how, the way this thing curls up. Um, the sort of thing you might do in protein folding type simulations. Here's the three body Let's see. Uh, let's stretch forward. Okay. Let's just drop to this <coughs> this one. This is uh, this is silicon. This is what's called the Stillinger-Weber potential, which is a famous potential published about 1985. This was one of the first problems that I worked on. And there we have a pair term, silicon atom interacting with a silicon atom, and then we have a term which says, uh, which is a function of the distance from I'm atom I, atom I to J, atom I, to, uh, uh, atom J to K, uh, J to K, and then this angle. There's an angular term here, and co uh, the cosine of 109 degrees 48, 109.48 degrees is minus one third. So what this says is when you have the ideal tetrahedral angle, this term goes away. But this penalizes any deviations from that ideal bond angle in silicon. That's what this term does. And this term is just to do with the lengths, the distances to the neighbors. Okay, so that is, that's in, in uh, sorry, in, in, um, in silicon. It turns out there's a whole bunch of parameters in here of, of num A's and B's, which you don't know, which you have to then fit to the uh, various atomic properties, various structural properties. Uh, let's miss out there. Now we go to the, you know, the, the we looked at p uh, pair potentials and we looked at pair functionals. That was embedded in atom method. We looked at cluster potentials. That was when we had the angular terms for silicon. Now we can kind of add those two, two together and we get cluster functionals. And this is what's called the modified embedded atom method, which was developed sometime in the 90s. And that's more powerful than the embedded atom method because it has the embedding term. But now the embedding term isn't just a function of distances. It also includes these angular terms. So this is now capable of doing uh, transition metals, covalence systems, uh, much more accurately than some of the traditional EAM potentials. But again, again, it comes with a cost of complexity and computational time. Okay, we're, get, we're getting near to the end of this part. We'll probably take a break in just a few minutes because at least one of us is getting tired. Okay, what is we've got a system with charge? Strontium titanate, uh, zir zirconia, zinc oxide. Then what do you do about that? Well, we have some basic physics we can turn to, which is Coulomb's law. Right? Two charged atoms interact, uh, interact with each other coulombically. Q1, Q2 over R in the appropriate units. So we have that interaction, that's the attractive interaction, then what do we need? We need the other interactions, and one way of doing that, and this is a traditional form, which we'll see later on, is to do a Buckingham potential, which is this exponential term, and the Van der Waals term. 
if you add those three together and you can then figure out what the A's, B's, C's are, you can actually describe quite well the properties of many oxides and uh, halide type materials. And it's computationally relatively inexpensive. There are some elaborations on that, something called the shell model, which deals with the internal polarization of the atom, which is important if you're looking at things like dielectric properties or ferroelectrics and things like that. We'll see some charge uh, potentials later. Okay, here's more and more, detail, more details than we need to go through on this. And here's sort of a, just a summary table of uh, where things kind of work. So Leonard Jones works for noble gases, as does the Buckingham potential. The Morse potential works for diamond type systems. EAM and embedded atom method, EAM and the modified, work for metals. But the EAM also works for semiconductors. And then you have a whole series of things for organic systems. And then you have things for the ionic systems. But what you can see here is part of our problem is that there's very little overlap. These are banded. Uh, that if you're looking at a problem in polymers and looking at a problem in metals, they're entirely different functional forms. And they don't play well together. You can't just bolt them together like Lego pieces. One's a Lego piece and one is the Technics. You know, they just don't work together. And that's part of the problem that we're going to address later on in the, in the presentation. Um, so these work well within these limited domains, but when you're looking for larger, more complex structures, then you have a problem. So we talked about energies at this point. Remember that we need the force. Well, so what we need is we need the derivative of the energy. So we take the gradient of the energy and calculate uh, that. And that can actually do, that actually can be a, a comp. You only have to do it once and code it up once, but it can be a complicated process and it's easy to get it wrong. Um, then there's some subtleties you have to deal with in terms of ap application. Um, for example, if you're looking at every atom interacting with every other atom, then the number of, of operations goes as the number of atoms squared. That's not good because you go from a thousand atoms to a million atoms, your work has gone on, up by a factor of not a thousand, by a factor of a million. And that's, not what, that's no good. There are ways around that. And this, these go by the name of linked cell methods and neighbor lists. A linked cell method basically says that I'm a, I know that... Uh, do you have zip... What, what's the equivalent of a zip code? Do you have a zip code in, Ameri in, in Germany? A, like a postal address? You know, it's a postal code? Right. And so your postal code is your postal code is, an, is Arkan 1. You know your, neighbor, your neighbors are in Archon 2, Archon 3, Archon 4, etc. Right? You don't have to worry about somebody whose address is Cologne. They're so far away, you're not, they're not going to be your neighbor. And so what you can do is you can actually set up for a structure by cutting it into slices, essentially, or, or little cubes. You can give each of them an address like that, Archon 1, Archon 2. And you set it up in such a way that if you're in one block, only your neighboring blocks are atoms which you're going to interact with. That then turns an n squared problem into an order n problem. And then you can go further and then just look at neighbors. And, and count, and, and so there's methods to make this much, much faster. So that's how you implement this. So these are the sort of traditional um, um, imp uh, classical methods. So this is kind of, the, if you like, the end of the introduction, uh, the end, end, end of the first half. We're going to move on to something a little bit more uh, uh, frontier, a little bit more challenging in the next part. This part. It's a little bit of a side direction, and I think I'm going to skip over it, um, because I have about an hour and a half, about an hour and a half left, about halfway through, and I want to really focus on the new parts, and I want to take at the pace at an appropriate pace and give you opportunities to ask questions. I'd rather cover a little bit less and have you learn a little bit more than cover a little bit more and have, have you learn a little bit less. So we're going to skip over this part. So we're going to move to these, what we call charge optimized many body table problem potentials. One of the big things when you, when you develop something new is you have to come up with a good acronym or a good little name for it. Uh, and there's some lessons from this. I learned one of the lessons I learned from Steve Plimpton. Steve Plimpton 
is the author of Lamps. And he only learned this afterwards. And he said, I'm so pleased that we spelt Lamps with two M's. Because if we spelt Lamps with one M, nobody will find it. But if we spelt Lamps with two M's, then it appears right on, on Google page one. Okay? So if we come up with a method or a, te a technique, give it a name, which is an, a speakable name, like home, or you know, there's React FF. Um, uh, React FF is better than Colm in the fact that it comes up on page one of Google search, right? Colm, you have to be a little bit more specific, Colm potential or something like that. So think about that when you name things. It's surprising those things can be very important. Coming up with good names. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to talk about these potentials and we're going to talk about some of these applications. So this is work. We were just talking uh, carefully about this. So this is work that I did with my colleague, Susan Sillett. Uh, she was a faculty member at UF for many years. She just moved to Penn State, Pennsylvania State University, to become head of the department there about two years ago. And she and I worked on this and related subjects for about 10, 12 years. We wrote about 100 papers together in that time. So that was a lot of fun. All these other folks here are my students <coughs> from our various from our groups, except Tao. Tao, Tao Liang is a research scientist, and I like to describe him as the chief architect of this code methodology. He actually started it before he, he joined the group, but he's the one who really uh, has, has given it uh, life. Now, we, this, these are methods that we're going to talk about, which are for, uh, remember that big triangular picture I showed? where you've got metals and ionic and, so, uh, and covalent systems, uh, covalent fat bonding, working together. That's what these were designed for. Um, this was all work funded by people like the Natural Science Foundation in the US, Department of Energy, a very small Department of Energy. Um, so here's that figure again, showing the, the metallic uh, covalent ionic bonding. And what we've seen, though, we've got the embedded atom methods. That's this purple arrow. We looked at uh, stellar weather type methods. And there's other methods. That's this light blue arrow. We saw the ionic potentials. That's this arrow. And as I said, none of these the, the methods for those work together. They, you can't just bolt them to each other and have them operate uh, to give you a uh, sensible system. So what we were, our challenge was to develop a methodology that would, would have metals, covalent, ionic materials working together. So this was something that we, that with Susan Sinnott was after I arrived, I arrived in Florida in November 2003. And so in February 2004, we submitted a large proposal to the National Science Foundation, which is you know, like they have fed uh, on this. And they funded us for five years on this project that we outset. It was, a, it was very exciting, my first big, uh, first big uh, project the foundation of a lot of our work. So, I just want to illustrate what goes into this. So, the idea is, if this, it, it, as I think I mentioned this, in out, in this example, if you're a silicon atom, if you're a silicon atom surrounded by other silicon atoms, then you're going to be covalently bonded. Right? You're going to be worried about your 109 degree bond angle, for example. You're going to be obsessed by that, in fact. Silicon atom. Is much more obsessed with that than diamond is. The diamond said, hell, I'll just be graphene or graphite. Um, so that's, but if you're silicon surrounded by oxygen, then you start to start becoming charged and start sharing, uh, become positively charged, and the oxygen become negatively charged. So that says that you're, if you're a silicon atom, you have to be able to probe your local environment and figure out who your neighbors are and what kind of bonding you have. Right? And it's not, it's not a, uh, you're not going to look. At, you, you're not going to say, "Okay, I've got more oxygen neighbors than silicon neighbors. Therefore, I am going to be ionic." And I'll just use that. Look up the ionic potential. Or I've got more silicon neighbors. Therefore, I'm going to use the tersile potential or the stellar weather. It has to be more subtle than that. And so they have to be able to integrate that. So here's just a simple illustration of how this method, when it's finally done, plays out. So what you're seeing here is we're seeing a pretty uh, a crystal of silicon, the nanocrystal of silicon, this is a few, uh, a few nanometers, embedded in a matrix of amorphous silicon. So
silica. Okay? And so what we've done here is these are, at this point, we've done some kind of simulation. These are now all, we've set the charges on all the atoms to be zero. So now we're going to say, to the, figure out what your charge should be. Okay, if I'm a silicon surrounded by oxygens, then I'm going to have some positive charge. If I'm silicons surrounded by silicons, I'm not going to be charged, but I'm going to be more covalent. And if I'm a silicon uh, surrounded by some other silicons and some oxygens, I'm going to be somewhere in between. And oxygen is going to be surrounded by silicon, and that's going to have a negative charge. So let's see how it played out. Of course, I won't be showing it to you if it didn't work. So now we're doing the equilibration in charge. We're not moving the atoms around physically. We're just allowing charges to change. And do your stuff. Why are you not doing this? Let's see. If I go to. Let's see, I can do it in another way so we can see this. Okay, the technology is not cooperating. Uh, hang on, let me try one more thing. Then I'll tell you a story which will make me feel better if it doesn't make you feel better about these uh, technologies. Okay, so you have to uh, trust me that it would have worked. Um, I've got to get out of this. I can't find the mouse now. Okay. Um, my apologies. For this. It didn't occur to me that that would work. So the story to make me feel better is a colleague of mine who's at Idaho National Lab, which is a, uh, a nuclear energy lab in, in the western part of the United States. And he was scheduled to give only a, like a five minute presentation to a visiting dignitary, so a visiting important person. And they did a lot of preparation for this. And the day before the presentation, he came in with his, uh, his computer and he set it up and he ran his videos, everything worked. The next day he comes in, the visiting dignitary there, the visiting important person's there. None of his videos work. No, nothing goes. So there he is, standing there with his MacBook, talking to Bill Gates, and none of his videos work. <laughs> so, you're wonderful people, but you're not Bill Gates. So. Okay. So what you would have seen would have seen is that these would have remained blue, and these on the average would become these red, uh, uh, and the, the, the silicon would have a charge about 3.4, the oxygen would have a charge about minus 1.8, there's twice as many oxygens as silicon, so the charge is balanced. And then right on the border here, the silicons would have some smaller positive charge, and the oxygens would have a slightly smaller charge too. But the point that that would have shown is that this these system was able to interrogate its local environment and figure out how to respond to that environment in terms of being of, of what charge it should have and what the interaction should be. And it did that autonomously. After I set up the potential, I no longer have to, I don't have to interfere with it. I just let it do its own thing and it gets that basic physics right. Okay. That's what we're going to illustrate. Uh, I'm going to walk through that kind of methodology for you. So here's another example. And there's no video on this, so it can't, it, it, it can't go wrong. 
And this is something to do with, um, and we chose this just because it illustrated the interactions. Uh, here's a system where we have a metal in contact with an ionic system, a large ionic system, which is copper and, and, and silicon. This is to do with interconnects. So this is a microelectronic device where you have uh, some silicon dioxide in, in, in contact with the, uh, with the, um, the, the, the copper interconnect. We want to understand something about that, the structure of that interface. So this was work we did early on, the sort of proof of principle. And so this is, this is not our work. This is actually work from the Elashkov's group at Cornell uh, using DFT. So here's using the electronic structure methods. And what they were looking at is they're looking at the, uh, the here's the copper and And it's a reactive uh, it's interface with the uh, um, amorphous silicon. And the question is, what is the bonding here? Here we've got copper, and this is silicon. Correct me one. Here we've got copper, oxygen silicon, so it's copper bonded to the oxygen. And here we have a slightly different structure with two oxygens. So these three are distinct structures between three different possibilities for the, the interface between copper and silicon depending on the termination of the silicon. And that's what they, they looked at from DFT. And so what they got from DFT was they got this example. So this is the, the uh, charge state. Uh, and what you see here is you're seeing now the fluctuations in the local charge, uh, the oxygen terminated case. And this was our cone calculation. So this was electronic structure. This is essentially molecular dynamics with no atoms. No, not no electrons. Sorry, no electrons. We have atoms. We have no electrons, but we do have charge. So what we're saying is we're allowing the system to be charged and the, allowing that charge to change, but we don't have the underlying electrons and the pins. And what you, these are actually on the same scale, and both, both this way and this way. And you can see we're large. There's differences in detail, but we're largely reproducing this fluctuation in the charge. Uh, the electron density, I think, uh, at the interface uh, from the uh, DFT calculation. Now, we can get a little bit more um, quantitative on that by we can look at the ideal work of separation. So this is the cohesive the energy of cohesion. It's the energy of the structure of the interface less that of the when you, you cleave the structure and you've got two free surfaces. So here's DFT LDA. And there's two different calculations here. Um, and you can see that, that they are ordered, the same order, it's, uh, that they go increase uh, from here to here, and the increase is somewhat over a factor of two. So first, this, this kind of reveals one of the, the dirty little secrets of DFT, is there is not a DFT value. There is not a single kind of DFT. DFT actually, it, there's many flavors of DFT, of, of different levels of precision. Uh, also, you don't know in advance which is going to be the best. And there are, there's uh, quite a lot of empiricism buried within DFT itself. So here's two different calculations where they differ here by this, this energy uh, by 40%. That's a big difference. This one, not so much. This one, 20-25% uh, difference. Between two calculations, the same level of sophistication purporting to measure the same thing. Okay. This is where I come. Uh, calculations. So again, this is without any electronic structure. This is purely this empirical type potential, which has charge awareness. And you can see that it matches up nicely. It's a, maybe a little bit low, lower than these two here, but certainly the order is right, the order of the magnitude is about right. And this is for a work of adhesion, which is actually quite a, a complex number because it's the difference of, 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 difference of large numbers to get a small number. So what we're seeing here is this, this empirical approach is actually capturing essentially the same physics as being captured by a full level DFT. Okay. So that's the sales pitch. Right? Now, hopefully, I, I, I'll tell you why you should care about what I'm going to say next. And so, how do we do that? So we start off with the, what's the essential physics of energy atomic systems? Atoms can give or receive electrons to become ions. That's the first thing. If we go back to the, the previous methods we've had before, they can't do that. In the covalent systems, 
Silicon is always charge neutral. In the metal, the metal is always charge neutral. In the ionic systems, you prescribe the charge. You say that, that, that uh, sodium has a charge of plus one, for example. Chlorine has a charge of minus one. But it doesn't change. And it can't re respond to its different environments. So how does the or receive the electron to become ice? We want to capture that. We want to allow that to do that autonomously, automatically without us interfering. And so there's different bond types. So electrons uh, share amongst all the atoms and metals. Covalence electrons share between two atoms. And our next electrons transfer between the atoms. Now, uh, we're not going to have the electrons, but we're going to have the basic physics that captures all of those effects embedded into our empirical form. Okay, so what does it look like? It gets pretty nasty. It's pretty ugly. This is real material science engineering, if you like. You know, it's not pretty, and it's it's uh, you, you can't really justify it. You can't sit down and derive these things. You kind of you you just use them, and you you, um, you take a, a very practical approach. Does it work or does it not work? That's the approach we take. So. So, I'm messing with this, the back of this came off already. Oh, I lose it. There we go. So, the total energy is going to be a sum of various terms. Um, so, we have one term here which is said is something to do with charge. Charge only. And it's saying that there's an energy. So, if we know that, we know that if we have an atom, it has a preference or no preference of becoming an ion. Chlorine really wants to grab electrons. It doesn't like being an uh, isolated chlorine. It would rather be a negative ion. Sodium would rather be a positive ion. We need to give that, that energy, the energy cost associated with those processes, uh, we need to capture that. That seems like the ionization energy. So we want to capture a part of physics which has the ionization energy. Okay, so here's the really is a, a term which is all Q, um, and then we add a bunch of other terms which have been used in the literature, which just, just goes up and gives you the shape of that ionization. Yeah. Essentially, uh, the, you know, for one electron, two electrons, three electrons, four electrons. Okay, so this is something that's telling us the cost of an atom becoming an ion. Then we're going to look at a term which reflects bond order. Now, bond order is really just another term, another way of describing what we looked at before, which is this embedding energy. Bond order is, set, is again, this energy an atom has uh, where, where it is interrogating its environment uh, and, and having an energy which is related to its number of neighbors, to the location of the neighbors, the charge of the neighbors, things like that. So that's, a, that's called a bond order term. Um, it's also called an embedding energy term. This comes from the literature that Tersoff is a bond order potential. Rebo, the reactive empirical bond order potential by Brenner, is a, a bond order potential. That kind of comes from that language. Now you can see, I'm not, we're not going to walk through all these terms, but what you will see is, is this is energy as a function of position. It also has a function of charge as well. So this is something which says that my interactions depend uh, between two, two, two individuals or two atoms depend not only on their relative positions, they depend, they, they depend on their charges. So if we were to do an optimization process, we would not only optimize our positions, we would also optimize our charge as well. And then we get into the hairy, all the hairy arithmetic. And we're not going to go through all that, but there's lots of terms. And all these betas, and alphas and H's and D's and C's, those are parameters, those are numbers, which at this point we have no idea what they are for any given material. We're going to have to figure out what they are for any particular material later on. Okay. Now we're going to have this, what we, what's known as QEQ. This is charge equilibration is what that says. That's this in the process of the atoms, each atom autonomously figuring out what, what its charge is. And that's got this. So we wrote, wrote down this self energy term a minute, minute ago, this is the ionization. We had a couple of extra terms here. We're not going to, we, we're just illustrating it here. So here's a potential energy, a simple potential energy term, and a simple self energy term. 
So you can see this has got Q's in, this has got Q's in. So these two are coupled to each other. So we can now write down, we can go through the process of actually, if we had this term, we could write down Newton's equations of motion for the positions. Now we have an energy here, we can go through the same process and write down an equation of motion for the charge, how the charge evolves. These are called, you use Lagrangian methods, these are called extended Lagrangian schemes. You may be familiar with your MD. This is how the thermostat can be done, or how the constant pressure algorithm works. It's essentially an extended Lagrangian, where you're increasing the, the number of degrees of freedom. And so to do that, you need, here's the V part. So if you think of uh, uh, Lagrangian, where you write down L is T minus V, and then you go through the Lagrangian process. So we have, here's the V, and what's the T? Well, the T, traditionally, here's mv squared, right? That's kinetic energy of the atoms. Now what we're doing is we're adding a, a term which says what's the inertia of the charge. How <coughs> resistant is the system to, change, to, to the charge change? So this m is a fictional mass associated with the resistance to charge moving through the system. Is this method implemented in the labs? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is the simplest way. The actual implementation comes out to be a little more complicated, but this is a way to understand the methodology, and this is the way we kind of we started it off. Um, so once you've got these equations, you can go through the Lagrangian process, L equals T minus V, and then you have the DL by DQ minus V by DT of DL by DQ dot equals zero, and you get two equations of motion. You get an equation of motion for the positions and the function of time, and you get an equation of motion for the charge of the function of time, and they're coupled to each other. So then we can go back to our old friend the Verley algorithm, and we can write down an equation of motion. Uh, we could advance the positions of the function of time, and advance the charges of the function of time. Now we have a system where the, 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 the charge on any atom can change autonomously in an algorithmic way. That's the, that's the basis behind it. Now, of course, there's ugly details in the implementation, but that's the basic process. So here's, here's an example. So if we write down, here's writing down the Lagrangian. This is the real uh, half mv squared velocity. Here's this fictional charge velocity. Here's the potential charge. And here is the Lagrange multiplier, which conserves, fixes the charge. So those who take the classical mechanics class, probably most of you have, uh, then you'll see something like this. And then we get these two equations of motion. And so you integrate that, and you find that you, uh, uh, this is for a given atom, that the, the value of the charge is fluctuating, which is what you'd expect. It's, like it's moving around too, right? Its position is, is changing as a function of time. This is vibrating around some position, and its charge is changing. But you can see this is 1.4, this is 1.3. So if you estimated the charge on this thing as being 1.35, it's probably pretty close. Now, this is, a, this is, this is another video that's not going to work. Oh, this one may work. This is the same, so this is copper inside CU2O. So the color scheme is what we had kind of had before. This bluish color is charge neutral. And then the, these are the oxygens, which are a strongly negative charge. These are strongly positive charge. And we're seeing uh, the variation of the charge around that core. And this is something which the system Sorry. So the system again went through and, and just by, just by running this algorithm, it went through and determined that. So the the, the coppers aren't intrinsically different from each other. <coughs> they just figured out the local environments and responded differently. So if you directly in the two pieces, this is structure in the middle. Yeah. Separate them and after that, bringing them together again. Yeah. After that, the bonding, the little the pieces will be bound to each other. So, is it not in the way that we can uh, select automatically the bonding? Because, okay, you separate the structure and there are two pieces, and okay, the bonding will take a place to uh, bring these two pieces together. Because the 
bonding is okay. If you, I mean, if you do the DFC simulation, it depends on the amount of energy to, the, uh, to bond taking place. I'm still not quite, not quite sure. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tear down these pieces yeah. of paper. Yeah. And okay, separate them. Right. Well, do you mean down the middle here or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Separate the two pieces. Okay. Take it in one side and yeah. another one to yeah. another side. Yeah. After the summing it, I will bring them back. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. After that, the, the bonding takes place and happening. The bond is, well, the bond will reform. Reform. They will reform. Okay, so, uh, is it real? Realistic? Okay. Well, it's, it's, real, real. it's realistic in terms of the physics and the basic chemistry. You know, the microstructure is not very realistic because it's all perfect structures and all that stuff. But that's, that's, that's a different problem that we face in doing material simulation. Nearly always our microstructures are, you know, they're chemically pure, typically where the experiments are not chemically pure. Um, they're idealized uh, structures. Uh, but from the point of view of the physics and chemistry of, of uh, bonding, uh, having here basically metallic bonding and ionic bonding, this is at least qualitatively and probably semi quantitatively correct. So, uh, uh, the energy needed to reform uh, <coughs> reform is not measured in this atomic, atomic potential? It could be. So, we could, we could we could work out, as we did with the copper uh, silica, we had a work of, a work of adhesion essentially. Um, and we could calculate, we break it in half. And uh, then we could work out, we we're allowed to equilibrate because we find the surface, if you have a surface here, that would change the charges a little bit. So it's responding to that. And then we would get some energies and we, would, we could work out what the uh, work of adhesion is. So that's the sort of basic physics that goes into this. This, this, uh, this environment awareness, which we saw in the embedded atom method, plus the ability to determine charge. And that's ca all captured in these two, essentially these two equations of motion. One for the positions of the function of time, and one for the charge of the function of time. And those, uh, so from a point of view at ND, all that really means if you solve this in a direct ND method is you add one extra line essentially to ND for the charge evolution. Of course, it turns out the devil's in the details and it's actually a, little more, it's a lot more complicated than that to implement. So what sort of implementations have we got? So COMP has gone through various generations. As you can see, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a complex concept. And so we've settled this third generation has been around since about 2011, something like that. So that's pretty much settled there. And you can see we've looked at various systems here. And these systems have been just been determined by the particular applications that we were interested in at the time. So we've looked at copper hydrogen options, uh, carbon hydrogen option systems. Here's one we're looking at uh, molecules, uh, nitrogen, ammonia, and NOx. Zirconium, zirconium, zirconium hydride. That was a, for a nuclear fuel plant. Uh, zinc, zinc oxide, uranium, uranium oxide, and all these various others. We now just, uh, I was just submitted a paper on CNOH. Uh, so we can look at nitrides, and cyanides, and things like that, and all these various other systems. Uh, in each of these, one of the the part of the philosophy was to try and make this as transferable as possible. So, for example, the oxygen oxygen interactions here are the same as the oxygen oxygen interactions here. So, if you wanted to use, look at uh, something, uh, uh, look at an organic molecule on, an, on a nickel surface, you could bolt these two pieces together. Now, you may have to figure out some of the additional interactions, but they're not mutually, they're not incompatible with each other. I mentioned REACTS FF. Some of you may be familiar with. It's very, in many ways, it's very similar to this. They developed it roughly about the same time. Um, in fact, we've written a couple of papers with Adrian Van Doon, who's the main name associated with React FF. And when we look at the functional forms, the functional forms look different. The equations are different, but you can we can do a pretty much a one-to-one -one match and say, well, the, the job of this term is to capture this physics, the physics of ionization. But in our Cole potential it's written this way, and his potential is written that way. We can kind of go through and make those matches and, and see that all the basic physics is accounted for in the, in the two potentials. Um, we, we've done that. And there's a different, slightly different philosophical uh, take we've taken. You know, as I said, that, that the oxygen, oxygen interactions are all compatible here across this whole range of materials. 
what he tends to do is he has a problem he's interested in. So maybe he's interested in two problems involving carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen and oxygen. One may be an explosive, for example, but one may be a biomolecule. What he'll do is he'll, he will develop a parameter set to each of those problems, which are different from each other, and they won't, won't play together. So he, he focuses very much on the problem to hand to get the best fit. We, fo we focus on getting a more uh, transferable, more transferability, but with, but with su there's some sacrifice of accuracy for any given problem when you do that. So Cohn is in the Lamps distribution, has been for a number of years, um, including many of the third generation potentials. And those third generation potentials which do exist which are actually in the official Lamps distribution we're happy to provide. It's just a question of, we haven't caught up with all the LAMPs stuff. So it's a keyword in LAMPs um, that can be used. So how much does it cost to do? So here's, here's some measures. This gets actually from the LAMPs manual. <coughs> so Leonard Jones, our old friend Leonard Jones, on, on 32,000 atoms, uh, it takes one, one unit of time to run this on a certain machine, certain number of nodes, at a certain point in time. But these numbers aren't going to change very much. EAM, the better than that method, is two and a half times more expensive. First off is four times more expensive. Still into weather is four times more expensive. Now let's go down. Coal with full charge equilibration is 284 times, so 300 times more expensive. It's a lot more expensive. Reacts FF, 337. Probably those two numbers are pretty, pretty close to this being the same number of that. There's not that much difference. But they are expensive. But they're not as expensive as VASP. So I guess this is based on <coughs> some VASP calculation uh, and it's scaled up, then that's 17 million. Okay. 17 million times slower than the learner Jones. So this is expensive, but it's no longer prohibitively expensive. It can be used. Now, let's say you're interested in aluminum. And you look at that, that problem I showed earlier on. You want to do a better job because now 15 years later from when I did it, you want to do it again and, and do it better. You wouldn't be using a potential here. You'd be using an EAM potential. EAM potentials are great for, for, for FCC and HCP methods. They work really well. Uh, and there's new generations coming out all the time which work better and better. Uh, but if you're interested in a problem where you've got a metal, uh, say, uh, corroding, oxidizing, or reacting with water, then you know, EAM just doesn't work. You have to use one of these more advanced methods. So that's the common, those are the reactive fast. Okay. So it's in the lab's distribution. It is expensive. You have to really need its capabilities to use it. If you don't need its capabilities of this charge equilibration, different kinds of bonding, then don't go near it. So it costs you too much. Use one of the simpler methods. So here's uh, another example. So now just throwing some, throwing some examples up. This was uh, silica and hafnia. Uh, silica and hafnia. Hafnia is a, a high-k dielectric material replacing silica. And so we were interested in the interface between uh, silica and hafnia. So this is just showing the crystallographic structure. And now we're showing what the charge structure looks like. So now the familiar red, which is the uh, strongly, uh, uh, strongly uh, strongly negative, blue is strongly positive, and these are charge neutral, and there's some sort of charge transfer here. But this again is done with a, a simple um, uh, column potential. We can look at stability of various um, structures. So this is the one thing, one of the things that we have to do when you develop potential. Say you're interested in TiO2. TiO2 is an important material for all sorts of, uh, it has all sorts of photo properties. It's also the main ingredient of paint, the main, in, main ingredient of many cosmetics, uh, suntan lotions, all sorts of things. Titania is everywhere. Um, and say you're interested in this particular structure, root heart. It's not good enough just to, to build a structure and say it works. What you have to do is you have to show that your structure is actually stable. And so, for example, this is what we go through, the profile of the process we go through, is looking at the energy of all these other rival structures. Uh, so this is experimental values, uh, energy 19, which are 19.9, 19, 19.85. Uh, we get that the Brookhouse slightly more, uh, is, is higher in the annotated part. You 
can see our difference is uh, larger than the experimental differences. It's a weakness of the potential. At least we're getting the right word. And this is not, th this is in a sense a prediction, but also part of the fitting process is to get these kind of things broadly correct. There are a lot of potentials out there, for example, for, for titanium which get the order wrong. And therefore, if you do mechanics on them, you may get some very strange things going on. Um, what do we have here? We have some surface energies. I won't go through into those. Um, here is here's the heat formation of uh, some uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, just look at this, this, this figure here. This is the uh, uh, heat formation of these various um, molecules here from experiment and from home. And you can see they match up very, very nicely. So, so this is, so we can actually reproduce these experimental values. And that's part of the fitting process, it's part of the training, the potential is to get those kind of numbers right. Okay. Um, here's, here's an example with copper, hydrogen, and copper. So we, look, we want to develop that potential, so we want to look at organics on copper surfaces, but catalysis, so one of the ways to do that is to look at some small molecules. So this is copper, uh, uh, metallic, so there's some uh, hydrocarbons, things like that around it. And we can actually go out and we can calculate uh, various values. This was a target value, which we matched to the heat of formation, which was identical. And then we can go off, and then we can look at uh, the binding energy absorption energies, uh, here, here methyl absorption energy onto various copper surfaces. And we get a pretty good agreement uh, between the uh, cold values and the DFT values. And again, this is going to be this calculation. Now we have this potential. These kind of calculations are going to be you know, 100,000 times cheaper or 10,000 times cheaper than the DFT calculations. We're essentially capturing the right physics of this. So we can look at these things. Now dynamically, we don't have to just do static calculations. We can actually deposit these things, and we've done that. Let them rain down slowly on the surface, let them move around, find optimum positions. Maybe they break up, maybe they move off. We can do all those things dynamically, which is very, very hard to do with either ab initio and be very, very expensive. So here's one example. This is ethyl association of an ethyl on a copper uh, 111 surface. So here it lands on the surface, it kind of gets into, a, into its appropriate relationship. You can see this is the top, this, this is charge transfer, the different color here. The green is charge neutral copper. Now there's some kind of charge transfer taking place here. Uh, and then at this point, the bond breaks, and then these things start to move away from each other. So we've got CH3, CH2, got the CH3 plus the CH2 radical. And you can see these numbers, uh, doesn't matter what the actually measuring, but this is DFT versus COM, and you can see it's pretty good semi quantitative agreement between these two. So this is now looking at catalysis and surface chemistry of organic materials using classical ND methods. Uh, butane formation. Um, here you can see we've got a, a bunch of different molecules come down, and now we're seeing uh, a complex chemistry, so we're going from one side uh, to another size molecule. So we're getting, uh, we're again, we're getting organic chemistry being mediated by the presence of this metallic surface. So we have to have the organic interactions right, the covalent interactions of the surface right, we have to have the metallic bonding right, and we have to have the interactions between the two right to get this uh, to agree. Uh, here's another one. Can you measure the energy difference? Yeah, you, you, I, you got me there. What with this may be a heat of formation uh, of these are the small molecules. Uh, I have to go back. Uh, I have to go back and actually look at the papers to exactly what these are. Um, the point, more to the point for, the, for this purpose, is that we're measuring. We are determining using our potential something which is determined experimentally and comparing the two. And you can see that they broadly they, they agree pretty well. And they're, in, they're, they're measures of the energy. I don't know if it's the formation of energy or, or the cohesive energy. I don't remember which one it is. But it's a, it's a measure of the strength of the interactions in that system. Uh, 
Uh, here's another example. This is uh, carbon dioxide and H2O deposition on, on, um, on, on, uh, on zinc oxide. So we get CO2 absorption. We get CO2 absorption on, oh, so there's copper with zinc oxide. So there's a copper cluster here. So the CO2 absorption on the zinc oxide, the CO2 absorption on the copper iron. Uh, we get water as also absorbed on the zinc oxide. We get CO2 association. We get the formation of, of copper carbonate uh, with the oxygen, uh, with the CO2 being oxidized. So you can see there's a lot of complex chemistry going on here. Now, one thing you one might do if you were doing a full, a full study of this, for example, is you, would, you might use some of these results and say, oh, we're seeing a process here that, you say, first thing you say is, oh, we knew about that process. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. But you might say, well, nobody, I didn't realize that could happen. And then what you might do is you might go away and do a high level VFT calculation or something like that to confirm it. So you can use this as a tool of exploration as well. Uh, but you might be able to break down to these individuals to try to examine them um, individually. So we, we can do a lot of different things here in terms of, of this uh, surface chemistry example. So Susan Sinnett, who I mentioned at the beginning, who is, you know, was my colleague on this, she's a chemist. I was trained as a physicist. So she was interested in all these kind of problems. Um, and then now we're going to switch to the kind of problems that I've been working on more, uh, which, are, which are more solid state uh, physical problems rather than chemical problems. So here's another one. Sorry, I've gone past it. This is uranium. Okay. And so I'm interested in this because, I, as I mentioned, I work quite a lot on on nuclear uh, materials, problems for nuclear reactors. Uranium is a very strange material. It's orthorhombic. Um, so, and this is the structure. It looks like this. You've got these sort of staggered planes. If, if these planes were flat then it would be tetragonal, I think, something like that. But you see this buckling of planes. Um, it has this orthorhombic structure, it transforms to a BCC structure, it becomes a liquid, and then there's this tiny little sliver of some other structure, structure we're not, not going to worry about. So back in 2000, by 2012, uh, there were no ways for atomic potentials for uranium at all. Uh, then we submitted one. Um, for review and the, the review came back and said, well, we just accepted a paper uh, with a new potential for uranium. It's not published yet, but we want, we want to cite it. So let's go through and do that process. So there's about three, three uh, new potentials came out within about three months for a material where, for which there have been no potentials before. So, um, so here's, here's the ela elastic constants, for example. Uh, so these are, this is a different potential. Uh, so this is, these are the errors in our potential. Uh, from experiment, 20%, 12%, 38%, 12%, 16%, 20%. I don't like those values. I don't like them being that big, but they're not atypical for interatomic potential descriptions of materials properly. <coughs> and no, I could, we could, by adjusting parameters, we could make some of these smaller at the, at, the, at, the, at the expense of others. But this is a fairly typical description of the interatomic interaction. You can see if you compare this with another potential, uh, Smyrnova, <coughs> she does a worse job on C11, uh, a better job on uh, uh, about the same here, uh, better here than we do, uh, a little bit worse here than we do. So, and that there's another potential, similar level of, of materials fidelity. Neither of them perfect. Now, if we look at uh, the, uh, the uh, volume, if we look at the thermal expansion, uh, this is kind of interesting. So the experiment is the solids and the calm is the open, open symbols. And what you can see here is here's the A axis, those match up nicely. Here's the C axis, those match up pretty well. And what we're seeing here is actually the, the you get a, this is actually a decrease in the B direction. It's very hard to see in the experiments, but it is there. And we do get a decrease in the B direction. So you have a negative thermal expansion in one of the directions which is a pretty unusual behavior, which, which we capture. Yeah. So that's capturing the alpha uranium. We can also capture the gamma uranium, which is BCC. So that's uranium, and I said, well, what, I said, you know, if you're interested in just aluminum, why use, don't use, use our method 
uh, don't use coal. But we're interested in uranium and uh, oxidation of uranium and uranium dioxide. We want to be able to do all of that together. So that's why we're using our method. So this now is the coal potential for UO2. So we've done the uranium part, we've, we've done the UO2 part. We'll bring them together in a minute. And uh, we get a fair level, a fair level of agreement. Uh, let's pick one out, C12, Coleman and, and experiment DFT all agree. Here's the fault modulus, they all agree. Uh, here's the use of formation, they do a pretty good job. Uh, so we're doing actually a pretty, uh, pretty good job here. Here's some uh, vacancy formation images. So these two are pretty good, this one's not so good, nor is that one. We've, we've worked on that, improving that. Recently, so uh, this is giving a reasonable uh, level description of UO2. So now we can do things like what happens when an when we put oxygen into uranium. That's a question you can't even ask with like an embedded atom method potential. That says I only deal with metals. Now we're, we're saying well, what's the oxidation process look like? So if we go through this and we put in a and this is a place where we can actually compare things with EFT. Uh, so here's our initial structure. You see those, <coughs> uh, those uh, staggered um, planes again. And we put in some oxygens here. Then we go through a DFT calculation and we get some distances. We go through a current calculation and we get similar values 1.98, 1.96, 2.33, 2.16. This one's lost the value, I don't know what that is. But you see the structure that we get is, is similar from DFT, where we've got all the electrons, and from Cone, where we're just using an empirical approach. Then we can go on and ask all sorts of things. What happens when we put in lots of oxygen? If we take a metal and put in lots of, lots of oxygen, we can add that in, then we can bring that in, and then it starts to form domains of UO2, which is the fluoride structure. So we begin to see the process by which oxidation takes place in this material. We can also look at um, uh, 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 and this is a, a continuation of the oxidation process, and what we find is we we find we get domains of different orientations of this this uh, cubic fluoride structure within this orthorhombic structure. So as this as this um, uh, as this polycrystal is uh, uh, as this as this uranium is oxidizing. It's oxidizing into a different into a polycrystal, not a single crystal. So we're learning information there about uh, oxidation behavior. Okay, so I think that's that's what I want to illustrate the capabilities of phys in, in physical problems and chemical problems of this comb approach. So this will be a good time for another round of questions. You always mention EFT. Yeah. You know, it, it, it varies. I mean, it, it, practically what you do with DFT is, is typically you go in and you use, uh, you know, you, you do an LDA calculation. You'll do a DFT, uh, GGA with a, like a PAW, PBE. And you'll look and see how they compare. There's one overbinds, one underbinds. One tends to underestimate band gap, one tends to overestimate band gap. So typically people often take a very, very practical approach and do the basic calculations. And, and, and then you pick whichever one gives a better agreement and use that. Um, even though GGA is better, it's capturing more physics than, than, uh, than L GGA is more physics than LDA. It doesn't guarantee it's giving you a better value. And uh, one of the challenges with DFT is that the approximations to DFT are not necessarily well controlled approximations. Uh, in that you can't write them out as saying that some order of the density to some power is being neglected. Um, so they're a little bit more ad hoc than that. Those are the EFT related issues. So it's a it's a, a tech practical approach. And then when you're dealing with things like uh, D electron systems and F electron systems, you have all sorts of electron lo uh, uh, localization issues you have to deal with as well. And the schema for that, some of which are well founded, some of which are a bit more empirical. But one has to take those into account as well. So it's a good question because you have, you have, if you're comparing with something, you have to, to know what, what, the, what, what you're comparing with and how, 
how much you can trust. And I forgot to put my microphone back on. I didn't want to take it in the bathroom with me because I didn't. Okay, any more questions on, on that? Oh, yes. No. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's physically reasonable. Yeah. Well, that, that, that means that they, so if you think of, uh, uh, of if, you, if you look at a DFT calculation, you'll find there's a charge density sitting between, you know, in the bond between them. So there's always a, there's often a, a particular compromise between ionicity and covalency. There's a certain amount of sharing and there's a certain amount of transfer. Um, and so you would, you're ex so what we see is kind of what we expect. Systems which are strongly ionic systems, uh, there's going to be more charge transfer um, than systems which have some degree of covalency. Now, our charges don't necessarily uh, they're not necessarily matching up with, with experimental values of charge. Uh, and that's not unusual. If you, look at the if you look at the fixed charge potentials for ionics, for example, you can, this, this potentials for silica, which have silicon as 4 plus, and this, this potentials have silicon as 2.4 plus. They, they're, they're compensated, that, that, that difference is compensated for somewhere else in the potential. But, but broadly speaking, things which are more charged here are physically more charged. The, the rough order is about right. I don't know of any real uh, absurdities where we get, you know, uh, we get positively charged oxygens or anything like that. We've never seen those kind of situations. This is a, always a, it's always a, uh, a tricky question. You know, one would love to do use all experimental results if we had them, but we, in general, you don't have a set of complete experimental results almost for anything. And often they're not even, even if you did, they're coming from different sources and there's no guarantee that they're actually mutually compatible with each other. Um, so DFT provides you a consistent, internally consistent set of values. They may all be wrong, at least they're internally consistent. Uh, and so often we use DFT values um, so we, we, use ex we, can, we do use experimental values for things like heats of formation and stuff like that. Uh, but it's, it's a bit of a mix. Uh, we try and at least be careful in documenting that so that when you look at it, you can tell us we're idiots and we should have done it a different way. It's your prerogative. But, we do, but that's about the best we can do. So we use our best judgment and then try and document that as well as possible for the reader so the reader can agree, at least, at least, at least not understand what we did and agree or disagree with that. And take a different approach if they care to. Sorry, so I think this cobalt uh, potential is quite useful for this, uh, this uh, oxide uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Is that possible for to using, uh, for instance, like this cobalt potential? They have a formula, right? So is that possible to generate uh, all of these uh, any? I mean, any potential for any system? So for instance, like uh, so, there as we know for this. Uh, uh, the, I think the most uh, uh, shortcomings is because of uh, normally if I, I want to do some uh, research on the other systems, so we don't have this potential. So, right. so, so, so there's, two, there's two parts of that. One is the potential form, which is the equations, right? And this, this form is, there's a lot of equations in it. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of parameters. And that's what part of what gives it the capability of describing lots of different things. But the other side of that is we have to determine what those parameters are for any given system. And for, so for something like a CHO system, there may be 60 different numbers you have to, you have to develop. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the next part. But there is, but there is no universal potential and with where you can say I can do it with a universal set of parameters. They don't exist. Now, DFT, largely, you can pretty much take almost any material and put it into a DFT calculation and, and get something reasonably sensible out of it. There are some well-known pathologies and you have to do some tricks for different systems, but you don't have to, 
you can take bats, but you don't have to. You personally don't have to develop anything new for almost any any system you're likely to be interested in. It's probably in bats already. In this case, every for empirical potentials, you have to develop them one at a time for the system you're interested in. That's one of the weaknesses. And as I think I mentioned before, that that can take a long time. It can be a major part of a student's PhD. It can take a year or more, and it's it's a little unpredictable. So that's why we, that segues, you get your five dollars for asking the question, that segues me into the, to the next part of the talk. Uh, of course, any more questions first? Okay. Okay, the, the, this is the last piece. And this is what I mentioned before, rational design of classical interatomic potentials. So we've seen these potential forms, lots of parameters. How do we determine those parameters? And I'll talk about the traditional way of doing this. <coughs> then I'm going to make a stupid analogy, which I hope will, of, of what that traditional way is. Then I will give you the analogous rational way, and then we'll go off into the rational development. So you see there's this little link uh, in, a, in a silly analogy. OK. And this is work uh, that I've done. Uh, largely with, um, largely actually with uh, Chris O'Brien, Stephen Foyles at Sandia National Labs, and Eugene Rigassa and Richard Hennig at UF. Um, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about how we fit into atomic potentials. Once we've written down that functional form, how do we figure out what numbers to put in there to give me the right physics that I saw in the previous cases? And then I'm going to use my analogy, my, sim my, my silly analogy. It's going to be rational house buying. We're going to talk about buying, a, buying your first house. Okay? No, many of you may be, a, some of you may have done that already. Some of you may be a way, ways from doing that. But most of us will go through that experience. Uh, or at least renting an apartment. It's the same thing. Then we're going to apply that rational, to rational design of interatomic potentials. And we'll give some closing thoughts on this. So here's the challenge. So here's the functional form for the a potential for an ionic system. So we moved away from Colm for a minute. This is just a pure ionic system. And we're going to be looking at magnesium oxide, MgO. Pretty basic material. And so what do we have? We've seen this before. Here's the Coulombic terms. So we have some charge. And the red things are the things that we can actually, deter we, we can actually prescribe. So we could say that Z is, that Mg is 2 plus, because an oxygen is 2 minus. Or we could choose a slightly different value to, to have some level of covalency in the system. A, alpha, beta says A, there's a different A for magnesium, magnesium, oxygen, oxygen, and oxygen, magnesium. So there's three variables here. Likewise for rho, and likewise for C. So there's a whole bunch of different variables. Even for a system as simple as MGO, there's one plus three, which is four, plus three, which is seven, plus three, which is ten. Ten numbers I have to give specific values to, to, give, to, to, to say that now this is MGO. Yes, sir. So, what are the indices here? The alpha and beta indices? Sorry? What are the indices? Oh, alpha, alpha, here, alpha, uh, alpha might be magnesium or oxygen. Beta might be magnesium or oxygen. So, this is the interaction. Say, if alpha and beta were both oxygen, this would be the interaction between two oxygen atoms in my system, or two magnesium atoms, or two, a magnesium and an oxygen. Okay? So, we have to go through a process. And we can go through a process, there's 10 parameters, and we can go through them. People have done this for 30, 40 years. Back in the 70s, uh, people have been developing these kind of potentials. And they get parameters, and then you do some calculations, and often they work reasonably well. So one question we want to so how do we know if we that we have a good parameterization? And I use, this, I use the example of you know, the, the students graduating and the money's run out. Therefore, it's a good parameterization. Um, uh, it's a little bit more rational than that. We do compare properties with uh, some predictive properties, but you know, who's to say that 20% error in this quantity is, is good enough or the best we can achieve? Uh, maybe this, this whole form can only do a certain amount, can only capture a certain amount of physics. How do we, how do we probe those kind of questions? And that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, and then here's, here's Colm. This is, we saw this before, this charge term. Uh, and then the various terms to do with charges and angles and positions. So I told you there was a whole bunch of parameters. 
So this is the new NCOH parameter. This is a, these are the binary parameters. So this is a subset of the parameters and this new potential we just developed. Now, the point is not what the numbers are. You probably can't see the numbers. It doesn't matter. There's a whole lot of them, though. That's the point. And we actually had to go through a process, a systematic process of determining what those numbers were. And there's probably a better potential out there somewhere. We just haven't found it yet. One that, does, that reproduces the experimental values and DFT values with more precision. But we don't know. But this is, so this is the part of the problem. Okay. So how do we, do, how do we go about doing that now? So there are, there are codes out there. Our code is called POSMAT, Potential Optimization Software for Materials. And the idea is it's, it's meant to be reasonably fast and, and, and uh, reasonably, it's a, it's a parallel code, so it, it scales and does all sorts of good things. It's a reasonable approach to doing this. Um, in principle, yes. And so this is, so here we, we've used object-oriented programming, and so that the, you can look at d d different cost functions, and we'll talk about the cost functions in a minute. Uh, you can use multiple optimization techniques, so you can use uh, you know, gradient methods, you can use uh, Monte Carlo methods, you can use, um, or you can use simulated annealing type methods. Uh, we don't have all those in there, but there's ways to bolt, bolt those on. And then we can do various energy force type calculations. And when we do put this onto a lamp style interface, so the idea is it looks, it looks on the outside, has the same language as lamps, which is you know, widely used. And so the idea was to appeal to the lamps community of individuals. So what's the process we go through in, in determining one of those complex potentials for the, um, uh, for the comb, for example, where we had many, many... Uh, Simple, uh, many, many uh, parameters. So we have a sort of a, a, a systematic process. We start off with the elements. First of all, you have to get the elements right. So we look at, uh, we look at, uh, at simple elements. And the first thing we tend to look at is we, look, we tend to look at dimers. So, okay, a dimer for nitrogen makes sense, N2. Okay, that's a molecule, we know that. That makes sense. For aluminum, what does that mean? It doesn't, it, what, but it doesn't mean anything physically, but from the point of view of capturing, this is the simplest, simplest interaction of how one isolated aluminum will interact with another isolated aluminum. aluminum. Then it gives, tells us something about those pair interactions that we were talked about right at the beginning. Then we look at trimers. Then we build up to larger systems, solid state systems. If you go through this process, then you can actually determine reasonable values for a number of parameters for that one element. And you go through for each of those elements and get some parameters that way. So first of all, we start off with the individual elements. Then, of course, then you have to start now looking at uh, electrostatic interactions. You want to get uh, the ionization energy is correct. What's the cost of, of ionizing nitrogen or the cost of ionizing aluminum? We can actually do those calculations with, with DFT or Gaussian or something like that, or there's experimental values in many cases. We can build those in. So that gives us some of the energy cost. So we've got sort of pair interactions plus the cost of the electrostatics of charging and uncharging things, we need to get, capture some of the physics. Then we add those together and look at some, some simple binary systems. Look at like a pairwise system, aluminum and nitrogen together. We might expect some charge transfer between the two. And one of them has a charge and one of them doesn't. Can we get that right? That helps us pin down some of these parameters. And we go through this process systematically, then we can actually develop all of these parameters. Now, it's not as easy as that because you get to this point and then you, you typically have to go back to the beginning again because something, something's not working. And you have to go through this process multiple times. It's incredibly frustrating. It takes months and months and months of, of very hard work, even by very skilled, um, skilled workers. And this is largely the... So here's the pure systems, diamonds and trimers, condensed phases. They look at surfaces and defects. Here's electrostatics. And then we're looking at a lot of the different binary structures too. So it's a similar kind of thing. But these are all the different environments we're trying to probe. We want to probe all the environments which are actually uh, going to be, be sampled uh, by the, the systems that we're interested in. That's a complicated process. So I'm going to focus back down now to our friend, the Buckingham Potential. As I mentioned, MGO. Okay. 
So we looked at this. And so what other sort of parameters we have? Well, here's, here's some. So this is one particular uh, parameterization. Mg is 2 plus, oxygen is 2 plus. The A value for this Mg on, uh, 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 for the magnesium oxygen is this value. The rho is this value. The C is set to 0. Oxygen oxygen is this value. And traditionally in these potentials, the magnesium magnesium, the cation cation interactions, are purely electrostatic. So there's no value here. So what did we end up with? We ended up with this number. What, that's, that's one number. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven numbers we actually set. So this is a, a parameter set of uh, seven different values. So this is simpl much simpler, but what we're going to do is develop this rational way of, of figuring out what those parameters should be, or, my, or would, what would make sense. So what do we typically do? How do we go about that now? We have these parameters. So that's the A, that's the A rho and C values and the charge. Collectively, they're known as the parameters of the potential, and then collectively, they're known as theta. Okay. We have an empirical potential, which is this form, which is a function of positions, R, and a function of these parameters, the Z, A, rho, and C. If we pick a particular value for these, then it will give us certain predicted material properties. It will give us a value of the, elast of the lattice parameter. It will give you a value of some elastic constants. It will give you defect energies. They may be really good. They may be really bad. But we'll see. So the, the, the process of potential fitting, the usual way of doing this, is we target some physical properties, Q. So we, we take a list of properties and say which are important to us. Lattice parameter is one. It's always one. We want to get the lattice parameter right. And actually, that's pretty easy to get right. We simply want to get elastic constants right. We want to get maybe a defect formation energy right, a surface energy right, those kind of things. And then maybe you have some other things you're particularly interested in, like uh, stacking forward energy or something like that you may want to get right. But you, you pre-select those. You pre-select your functional form. You have these parameters of the potential. You go through some kind of process, and that, uh, you plug all the, these into here, and it gives you predicted values, which we'll call Q hat. So these were our target values, Q, and we now have got predicted values Q hat for some set of parameters. So the goal of the fitting potential is to minimize the difference between the Q hat and Q. We want to minimize the difference between the, the projected value and the target value. We'd like those numbers to be zero, right? We'd like to, we'd like to predict everything exactly right, spot on to the three significant figures. But it doesn't always work that way because often if you decrease, the, if you decrease this value for one parameter, you'll increase it for something else. If you say, okay, I really want to get the, the uh, uh, defect energy right, then it may cost you somewhere else. You may get the elastic constants may not be very good. So there's a kind of trade-off there. And here's a list of things. So how do you go through that process? Typically what you do is you write down, here's the deviation, here's the Q hat, I think this is, yeah, predictive values for this set of parameters minus the target values. You take the square of that, you multiply it by some weight, and we'll talk about that in a minute, you sum that up, and that gives you a total cost. Okay, so, so you've got the error in the lattice parameter times some weight, error in the lattice parameter squared times some weight, plus error in the elastic constant squared times some weight, you add those, all those things up, it gives you a one number, a cost, a cost function. And typically what you go to do is you go through a process of minimizing that cost function. So you minimize this. Now, of course, you can minimize this by making five things really good and one thing so horrendous it's just absurd. But you hope to be able to balance that. So you guess some initial values. You pick some weights. You say, well, how do you pick weights? Well, you say, well, okay, I'm the elastic constants are really important to me, so I'll give those a weight of 100. I don't care so much about the defect energy. I'll give that weight of 1. Okay? That's the sort of thing you have to do, which is a crazy thing to do because there's no, you don't know how that's going to affect the actual final outcome. And the units aren't even the same, typically, because these are in different units, so these weights are in different units. 
So you really don't know quite what you're doing, but you're just you're putting in some value judgments. You're saying some things are more important to me than others. You put that in, you use some gradient optimization process, you minimize C, and it pops out some parameters, typically. Okay, and you have some potential which, which you can then assess. Is that good enough or not? So the final white parameters depend on these weights. We're not quite sure what these, and these weights represent preferences, but the weights aren't really directly related to the errors. You may find that you put a high, a high weight on something, you still have a large error on it. And the weights are defined at the beginning of the process. So what you're doing is you're putting your preferences in at the beginning of the process before you have any idea of what the parameter space looks like. None of these are, are, are good ideas. Okay. So that now, that's, that, so now I've set up a problem. Okay. We got to this point and, and th I'm, un I'm unsatisfied with this approach. So now that's the conventional approach. So now we'll get into the conventional house buying. Okay. So this is not how you took, but this is the analogy. If, this, if we use this approach to buy a house, we could say, okay, I've got a target cost over $200,000 or 200,000 euros. Uh, my target distance to work is uh, four miles. I don't want to be more than four miles away. Uh, my target distance to the train station is, is only a mile. I, I want to be within a mile of a train station sorry, or a tram stop or whatever, you know, something like that. Okay. So then I say, okay, well, what's really important? Well, money, you know, that's not the ultimate thing. I just don't, I can't make money. I can always travel a little bit further. Uh, I don't mind riding the, the, the tram two extra stops. Um, uh, but no, I want to be closer to the train station. So I put those weights on. And those weights are expressing my preferences. Okay. Now I put that into my machine, my house buying machine. Okay, and what comes out? It says, this is your new house. <laughs> okay, is it, and, and it will tell you how much it costs, how far it is to the train station, uh, and how far it is from work. You say, eh, not bad, maybe. But you don't know what's next door, right? You know, uh, there may be something you haven't thought about, something you didn't include. Maybe, maybe your in-laws live next door, for example. That may be great. May not be so great. Um, no, it could be next to, uh, you know, a, a factory or something. Who knows? Of course, equally well, they could say this is your house, right? That's this is the analogy of this uh, this process we go through, and that's our pot potential. Our potential is one of these houses. That's not a rational way of buying a house, and it's not a way, rational way of of of, of doing a um, potential. So what's a rational way of buying a house? Okay, so let's simplify the problem. House price and distance from work. Okay, let's imagine. So, so in this 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 uh, axis, we've got distance to work, and we've got price. You know, ideally, let's say in, in your particular situation, you'd like to pay zero dollars, and you'd like to have your your house next door to where you work. Right? They're the only two things you care about. You have no life. You're not a real person. <laughs> you're just you're just a researcher. Right? So what, what, do you, what do you do? Let's say you're trying to optimize to that. Well, you go out and you look at a house. Uh, there's a house. It has a certain price and it's a certain distance to work. That's the point. You go look at another house. Well, that house is the same price, but it's a little bit further away from work. So based on my only two criteria, house price and distance from work, there's no rational reason why I, I would even consider that house. Because, because the only two things I care about are the distance to work and the cost. It costs the same, but it's further from work. Therefore, that's not, a, that's not a rational choice to buy that house. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other things, other, other dimensions to this space, but we'll get to those in a minute. And you go through that process. Here we go. Blah, blah, blah. And, it, and then finally, you find that for that given house price, this is the closest distance you can get to work. Okay? So, so this would at least be a rational choice amongst that set. Now let's say we examined houses at a slightly different price. So this is, this is called, the, these ones are called dominated, and these are called Pareto efficient points. This is a language which is used 
actually in investment banking. So my student who's working on this is a very interesting guy. He, was a, he went to West Point, which is the US military academy. Uh, he was a soldier. He was an officer for a few years. Then he went and did a great degree in financial engineering at Columbia in New York City, which is a very prestigious school. And then he became a Wall Street guy for a few years. And in their language, what they are doing is their axes, they do exactly this analysis, and their axes are return on investment, which you want to be high, and risk, which you want to be low. But it's essentially the same. He, he pointed this to me, and, uh, and we've actually used this method. So this is a Pareto efficient point. It's, it's, a ration, it's a rational point. These points, it makes no sense to actually buy those houses. You go through the same thing for multiple different price values, and you end up with this structure here. So all these points here correspond to the closest you can get to work for a particular, value, particular price. Okay? And then it corresponds to this curve. So this curve is, this, is what's, called, what's called the Pareto front. And so it says that any choice on this front is a rational choice because it's a it's the best compromise you can make between distance and price. Any point behind this front is not a rational choice. But you can always find somewhere cheaper, the same distance from work, or closer to work for the same price. So this is, is a rational choice. Okay. So this is called the feasible region. This is the unfeasible region. Again, you can't get a house price for zero dollars right where you work. So here's our friend, Val, uh, Alfredo Perito. Okay. So that's just a simple, that you could go through that process and then you'd have to, well, we'll come to how you actually make a decision because all these are rational choices. We'll work on that in a minute. But typically there's additional criteria, right? Uh, you might be interested in the quality, of, if you've got children, you might be interested in the quality of the schools, for example. The access to transportation, which is the one we mentioned. Entertainment facilities, you know, might want to be close to uh, your favorite soccer club. Not too close, but, but you know. Um, or you might want to be close to a theater or, or whatever. Uh, again, distance to relatives, you may want to maximize that or minimize that. Uh, it probably depends on the relative, too. Okay? Uh, and some of these, these may be correlated. And that will be that was something actually can come out of the analysis. Typically, you know, um, you know, the quality of the schools is related to the price, how's the price price of the house, things like that. So we can add those in. If we add those in, then that two-dimensional plot becomes a three, four, five, six-dimensional plot. And instead of getting an arc, we get a surface. But on that surface, any point on that surface is a rational choice because it says we can't improve anything, one thing without making something else worse. So let's look at this again. Uh, so here's a a Pareto front. Now, where are you going to choose? Are you going to choose up here? Are you going to choose down here? Are you going to choose in the middle? So there's some sort of guidelines. So if you're at his, his three points, well, one, two, and three. If we say, say we're at a point two here, in our in a language of, of we had in house prices, you can move a, a, a big distance closer to work, but it doesn't cost you that much more. Okay. So maybe your target was 200,000, and for 200,000 you could live seven miles from work, 10 kilometers, but for 210,000 you could live five kilometers away. You may say, eh, for 10,000 10, euros, that's worth it, right? You might want to be here. Correspondingly, you might, be up, you, you might start up here and say, well, okay, this is $300,000, but it's only a mile away from, uh, only a kilometer away from work. I can go to this point, five kilometers away, and my price has gone down by 50%. So maybe that's, a ra that's maybe where I want to be. These are all rational choices, but now the, the point that you choose along here is your preference, based on your values. Now, in this scenario, we put our values in at the end, right? We didn't put them in at the beginning. We didn't, we didn't use the weights. What we had, we developed, we went through a process of looking at the whole ensemble of possibilities we came up with a list of rational choices and then we, then we injected our preference so it's to come out and then eventually buy, say, this house here. 
which is compromised uh, in, the t in, the t in the distance from work and, and the price. We made that choice at the end. Yes, sir. Yeah, it gets complicated if things don't if uh, things are non-convex, and that and that, and that can happen quite easily. Um, you know, distance distance is not a good measure uh, in house price, for example, you know, because some directions you know you're going uh, in an expensive direction, some directions you're going in a less expensive direction. So this is just a way of trying to get you to to to, to think about the problem. So. In terms of what we're going to do with potentials is we're going to develop a lot of potentials and we're going to do that Pareto kind of analysis on those potentials. Uh, so here we're going to look, for example, we're going to look at lattice parameter and we're going to look at two elastic constants. Because that's a three-dimensional plot, we're, what we're going to do is project that down to two dimensions just because it's easier to see. Okay, so back to our our, our problem, here's our functional form. We end up with this set of, of, of things we have to optimize, seven parameters, and we're going to include ten properties. Okay? So we've got ten properties we want to optimize, and we've got seven parameters we can choose from, what we have in the potential. How do we go how about doing that? Well, the first thing is we have to, f we have to start from some values. The whole we, have to start, we have to specify the sort of range we're going to search on. So one way is, for example, in this case, in MGO, we know uh, some of this, uh, there are some potentials out there already. Well, they're not bad. So let's use those as a guideline to start kind of determine the, the range at which we will look. So we know, for example, that some potentials have a Z of 2 and some have a Z of, of say, 1.5, or 1.6, or 1.7, something like that. So we'll look in a range of 1.5 to just a little bit over 2. We certainly, for magnesium, we certainly believe that a charge of 4 doesn't make any sense and a charge of 0.1 or negative value doesn't make any sense. So we'll kind of look over a range there. It's kind of like if we're doing the analysis on our, on our house, we're not going to look, we have $200,000, we're not going to look at million dollar houses. We're not even going to include those because we might look at 210 because we might have a, you know, we might be able to find that extra 10,000. So what we'll do at the beginning is we have to sample space, sample parameters. And what we'll do is we'll just say we're going to sample uniformly. Uh, from some low value to some high value. The charge goes from 1.7 to, uh, say, 2.1. And we'll just sample that uniformly at the beginning. And then the other parameters we'll sample uniformly. And we'll get uh, some, so here's the range we used. This was based on some other potentials. We'll visit those in a minute. And here's what we get. So this is the estimate of the error in the lattice parameter, estimate in the shear constant. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing the dominated points are blue and the Pareto points are yellow. Okay? So the first thing is, the first thing is that, so those dominated points means there's no reason we need to consider those further. Those potential parameterizations, there's always some, there's another parameterization out there which is going to improve, is going to be better on every level. So it's going to be better in uh, lower energy in G and lower in the lattice parameter. So we don't need to consider those. Now the yellow, as we can see the front here, now you can see some points here which aren't on the front. They're from the third dimension. Okay, we flattened that three-dimensional projection onto two dimensions in this case. And so you'll see some points here. Okay. So we learned something from this, but this is not very good, right? The errors are still quite large. And this, this is kind of sparse data. But what we can do is now is we can get a better estimate of the distribution. We go in and say, which, which of those points, if you look at the distribution, we start off with a uniform distribution of points we selected from. Now say, what, what's the distribution of points on the Pareto front? Those which will be rational choices. And then it looks like this, in this case for this particular parameter. It started off with some uniform range but it's clearly not uniform. And it turns out there's actually also a correlation which you can put in uh, between the A value and the rho value. They clearly lie along a band. So what we can now use is now we can use Bayesian methods uh, to start su using the, the post distribution as the prior distribution for the next iteration. So instead of sampling uniformly, we sample non-uniformly. 
from the space which we know is representative of the points which lie on this surface. To do that, we turn this distribution, for example, this is a histogram of the z-values, we use what's called a kernel density estimate, which basically you put a Gaussian around all these things and add it up, and gives you this distribution. So this is no longer a uniform distribution, it's now a peak distribution, and we go through this process multiple times. And when we do that, uh, this is after, uh, uh, this, is where th this is now looking at the full th uh, ten, pr 10 parameters, and these, this is the cluster points in the other eight dimensions are being flattened onto here. But you can see the, these errors, large errors here. Now what we're going to do, go through this iteration. Now you can see that there seems to be more, there's less data out here. It's getting closer and closer. And we're getting much more clustering around the origin here, the fewer points. These, these stragglers, we're still kind of working out what these crazy points are, but there's some strange structures in here. Now, you can't see much here, but now if I slice through that data, just in those two, so I take, instead of projecting down, I just take a slice, then we see here's the error in the shear constant here, here's the error in C12, and actually this is the Pareto front. That they, they actually linearly, rela linearly related to each other. So we can get, say, a 2020 or 2025 uh, GPA error. Uh, but we could choose one of the potentials along here, for example. Sorry, yeah. What's the meaning of the point on this Each point is a different parameterization of the potential, a different set of thetas. So the yeah, so I start off, I, I chose 10,000 at random to over, uh, uh, you know, with a uniform distribution in all these parameters. I analyzed those. I found that there was like 900 points on the Pareto front. Then I used the distribution of those values to bias the sampling for the next 10,000. And then I then they gave another distribution. Yeah, you get, because you're sampling from you're, you, you go through this process. You keep sampling from the, the you, it's important the sampling. You're sampling from the places which are most likely to give you points on the Pareto front and ignoring those points which are far away. You go through this as an iterative process. So now am I right that we're not using any gradient information? No. So, so we, and we've not expressed any preferences at this point. We haven't said this is what we would like. What we've said is this is what the potential can do. This is the capability of that potential. Now at some point, we have to select a final potential. We have, no, we have to, when we do MD, we have to select the value of theta. So we'll go through that process. And what, what you, can, you can do, we talked about the points out here. For example, there's a, a big savings in this error uh, with a small cost in that error. There's a sort of point of closest approach. In two dimensions, you can see it here. Um, here I've scaled them. So I've scaled them uh, by, uh, by this Q, which is our target value. So this is where now I'm putting my preferences in. So this would, for example, if we had the, the dollars versus the distance, then I would, this, this side of scaled by $200,000, and this side of scaled by four miles, and then a point which was 1,1 one, one would then be hitting both of my criteria, for example. Now it kind of puts things on the same scale, but this, now the point that's close to, this to here is kind of the point which is giving you the best compromise you can between the values you wanted. Okay? And then you'd pick that value. Now the nice thing about this is you can do that for if you, once you pick these Q's, which your, your, your comfort level with the error, you can then uh, go through this algorithmically. But the point is we're now putting our preferences at the back end, not the front end. And we can say, okay, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind for this problem. It's really important I get the defect energies right. I can go back and look at the same data set, essentially, and, and, and pick out a new potential. So this is a completely algorithmic process to the point where we make the final parameterization selection. It's completely automated. We have Python scripts calling LAMPS calls, doing all that stuff automatically. So what do you end up with? So here's, here's an example of, of our 10 properties. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing these, these three, these green, 
blue and red are the three potentials we used at the beginning. Remember I said I used the max, the, the re got a range of values of parameters from these pre-existing potentials? These are potentials which were developed by skilled people. These are good potentials. And this is the predicted errors in certain quantities by those potentials. These black dots are the predicted errors from, our, from not the best nine potentials using our algorithm. And you can see in most cases they are considerably superior or at least competitive with the potentials here. That's 10 potentials. Now we, we, we turn the figure sideways here and this is 100 potentials. All auto automatically generated and this is the distribution. You can see if we, if we uh, flip this up, this is really a sort of a Gaussian-like distribution. You can see here that they're, they're matching pretty well. Here's doing better. Here's doing a lot better. Here's about the same as these two, but on the other side, a lot better, better, about the same, better, about the same, better. So this process has now generated roughly 100 different pr potentials which we could use to describe this system um, with um, a fair degree of accuracy in an automated process, which you can actually go through in a matter of days. Another way of looking at this is a radial plot. So this is a radial, so this is the different, this is the lattice parameter C12. This corresponds to 100% error, 80, 60, 40, 20. And so the red potential looks like this star. And what you're seeing is all the potentials we developed to this black cluster here. So they're really largely inside the envelope of the other potentials. These potentials, these, these are, are, are basically better potentials than the potentials we started with. So th that rational design, so we input a, an uninformed guesses on parameters. We have an auto autonomous machine learning process. An output is a large set of rational poten potential options, and then we can s select a final potential based on our preferences. That's the process of rational design. That's not the only thing it can do. Uh, we've got some projects going with some, some uh, computer science centers uh, in the US related to this. One is to look f to use this process for developing a new potential for uranium, called a SNAP potential. This is a kind of a, a, um, a bond order type potential. It's Aiden Woods at Sandia National Lab. We've been working on that. Another is a project with some folks at Argonne, which is to, to look at the sampling. We were looking at 10 dimensions here. If we went to the uh, cone potential, we'd be looking at 60 dimensions. There you have real problems of uh, what they call the curse of dimensionality emerging. So even to get a good starting point can take a lot of work. So we're working on methods to, to help there. Um, we're working on measures of visualization. Now we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at these errors in 10 different properties. How do we visualize that in a sensible way? There are ways of doing that uh, visualization uh, that have been developed in, in other methods, other techniques. PCA, uh, principal component analysis is one. Um, I this is called uh, entropy something. I forgot what this is called. It's another approach. That the, the computer science folks use. And finally, we can start using these uh, for doing uncertainty quantification. Because now we have an ensemble of potentials. We can start using, sampling those potentials, using those in different ways to get uncertainties in predicted values. So not only are we going to get a prediction of a quantity, we're going to get some error bar on that. This is all emerging kind of methods. Uh, so those are the challenges. I mean, this is a challenge and opportunity largely from the perspective of this rational analysis, uh, sampling in large parameter spaces, fitting large numbers of properties, visualization. We can also compare, now start to compare functional forms. You could say, I want to add, I add another term to a potential. Does that make a difference? If you go through the Pareto analysis with and without, you'll see if it makes a difference. Or is this just adding complexity to the mathematics without adding any new functionality in terms of performance? You can test those kind of things. And then we can begin to do uncertainty quantification. So potential development is an old area. It's been around, as we saw, since, since the 20s and 30s. But it's a, still a very lively area. Uh, and it's going to become more and more so as computers become more and more powerful. Because although DFT is getting more and more powerful, MD is also getting more and more powerful. There's always going to be a whole range of questions that, can be tackled, that can't be tackled with electronic structure methods that can be tackled with classical simulation methods. So these kind of questions, we're going to be tackling these kind of issues uh, for a long time into the future. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you.
Question, yes. Okay. Nor am I, uh, frankly. I'm not. I mean, I'm not an applied mathematician. Um, there may be other ways of doing this, but this this is a way that we could actually um, control what the what the process in a in a rational way and see it at every step, and where we could present this kind of kind of data and. Now we could basically present our potential development approaches. Here's the, here's the algorithm. Here's the initial data set. You go through and you'll get the same results that we got. Um, most potentials you can't. You can never do that. So this is a, it's deterministic. Yes, it's de yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's determin it's, deter it's deterministic. And you can actually write down. You can actually write down the prescription that you follow. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know, uh, because you see, I mean, one way we can we can overcome it is you know we have to remember that 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 we've been developing those potentials by the seat of our pants already. So you know that potential I showed that was a student's work, you know, developed this potential for the CNOH system. We talked with a hundred parameters of whatever the number was. So she went through that process in a way which was an unguided process. Uh, so there are ways uh, we can uh, we can capture here. So for example. You know, in the stepwise process, we use the determining certain parameters first. We can we could add that into this, and then we we start with a distribution of those parameters, a very narrow distribution of those parameters. Then use those and propagate those through. So there's ways of, of then reducing the cursor dimensionality. If you start with 40 dimensions and just sample it at random, you're not going to get anywhere. Thanks, this is great. Mm. Well, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> We, we got a, we're, we're working on a we're working on a uh, a um, manuscript right now. It's getting it's getting close. Um, this figure I got it's this one of these figures. I got it from my my student this morning. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we set up bounds. Based on, uh, in this case, because there are other potentials for MGO, we took those three potentials and took the lowest values and the highest values and added 20% or something like that. You could, you could, you could set up anything you want. It would just take a longer, a longer to go through this process. That's all. Um, and you know, and going through, we're, we're right now we're doing 10,000 samples. Um, that is largely because it's being done on a laptop. We have, we're working with, because Argon is working on parallelization methods and stuff, so that you can start off with a million uh, potentials at the beginning. Because those, that, it's trivially parallel to go and calculate all those, uh, those, those energies. It's just a million parallel, it's a, no, it's a million independent jobs, then all the information is coming back. So there's a lot of, uh, of trivial par parallelization here. So you can do this on large clusters. So you can start off with a, with a fairly, li fairly limited knowledge range. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the fact that the, the whole um, the whole code, uh, the Python code, is completely agnostic uh, to the to the force field. What it does is it spawns off a job into lamps and asks lamps, give me an answer. And so that's in lamps is where in our case is where you specify. What the, what the structure is, what the force field is, and, and all different structures, and that's when you feed it back in. So yeah, you can, you can change that. Well, th there's no wrong formula uh, in, the, in the sense... Um, For example, if right now you, you, add, you have this uh, Buckingham and then you have yeah. uh, some other like a Ricardo force. Yeah. But what if we add a digital part program like a sign for sign? Like okay, yeah, so if we add, so, 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 two, so there's a number of things that could happen. Uh, one is that it just gives... 
Well, if the, if the parameter in front of it is zero, then we know it's going to just reduce to, that, to the, the case we had before. So for one thing it could happen is it, if the mathematics was at least well, well behaved, uh, then it might just, it might just select out a, a high preference for a value of zero. Now, if it was actually contributing in some way, it might, uh, it might uh, end up with a distribution around some other value. Um, now, of course, they could end up with binary distributions. It can be complexities there. Uh, but then we can also do things like principal component analysis. And you might, you might find out that the, this, this parameter in front of your sine function is linearly correlated with another, another term or, or a rela some, linear rela some relationship, which basically then says that term's not doing you anything any good because it's not capturing something which can't be, isn't being captured by in somewhere else in your potential. And so that would say that you're probably adding complexity without adding additional physics. So then you could, you could come in. And so you could then start, you could start then doing uh, analyses of this. For example, you could take a Tursoff potential and you could take the Stillinger Webb potential and you could you put them head to head for silicon and look, work out all the distributions and all the compromises and see you know, is, is one better than the other? Yeah. The understanding is that could be you just mentioned that you need a feedback or you need uh, some input from the lab, which means that you have to use your uh, parameter set to capture some quantity right. from that. Mm -hmm. So my question is or the challenge could be what if we target for some like very complex quantity like some activity? Oh yeah. Which that. is very you know you yeah. cannot immediately get an answer from that. Like yeah. Yeah. It takes quite a while. Maybe yeah. half day or maybe one day catch up. Yeah, yeah. One parameter, you will run like 100, 100 is okay, but you want to run like 10,000. Well, we've talked about that. You're, you're not going to be able to do that on the fly. What you're going to have to do, for these sort of dynamical quantities, um, you know, you're going to have to find some surrogate quantity, which is easy to calculate, which at yeah, least yeah. captures. Yeah. So you might calculate a Grunheisen parameter, for example, okay. Okay. and say, okay, that's capturing something. Uh, for the melting point, you may not have. Uh, you can't do the melting point, but you could look at the energy of the system uh, against a large volume excursion, not just the elastic constants, you know, which are 0.1%, 1, 1%, 1%, but a 2%. That's roughly the volume of melting changes, roughly 2%, I think. Yeah. So you could look at the volume at, mel uh, volume at melting, for example. And that, that means you're then going to capture some aspect of that curvature correctly. And then at the end, when you've got down to a finite number, say you get down to 100 potentials, then you could go do through so, some level of testing, and then you might go down, uh, you know, for thermal conductivity, you might go down to, you know, here's my three best or something yeah. like that. So it's, it's, it's very much in the spirit of kind of high throughput type. You have to do the quick and dirty stuff first, and then you can get more sophisticated as the number of potentials goes, goes yeah, down. Yeah, honestly, even if you calculate the Grunheim parameter, it's also not very easy. Right, right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You can put in some phonons information. You can put in fro frozen phonons, for example. You can put in the zone edge. Uh, you can put in a zone edge phonon and put the energy of that in, for example. And that then, as you know, you've got the, 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 the gamma point. You've got the, the line, right, because that's the elastic constants. And that, that means that it's going to roll over to the right value. That means you're going to get most of the phonon structure right. But that's not the, that's the harmonic part. Getting the anharmonic part is, is difficult. So. Yeah. 